בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה, ברוך השם, we're back, שנה טובה, שנה מתוקה, to everyone. We're back on our uh, Wednesday night uh, שאלות, uh, the uh, stump the rabbi, uh, we're up to, uh, ברוך השם, number 25. ברוך השם, this uh, stump the rabbi uh, series is the most popular now, ברוך השם. Lots of people enjoy it because it discusses a lot of different topics. They like your questions, so... Dr. Hashem, you guys have some questions. If you don't, Baruch Hashem, there's a few nice chidushim about the parasha, about a few other topics also. Uh, today's shiur will be for a uh, refuah shlema for my dear friend, Rav Alon Anava, Rav Alon Yehuda Yosef Ben Chana Miriam. HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives him refuah shlema, refuah tenefesh, refuah taguf. He's having uh, some uh, uh, complications with a uh, recovery for a uh, tattoo removal. Uh, Rav Anava, God bless him, even though he's not obligated to uh, remove tattoos, the mitzvah of uh, uh, the uh, sin of having a tattoo is a sin to get it. But once you have it, unless it causes Chilul Hashem, you don't have to remove it. But when a person improves and increases their level of kedusha, even the stuff that you don't have to do starts bothering you. When you see something that's uh, not kadosh, trying to elevate yourself, Baruch Hashem, he learns a lot of Torah and it starts bothering you that uh, you're not uh, serving Hashem even better. So uh, God bless him, he chose upon himself to uh, take this on. And of course, everything comes with a, uh, with a price and uh, there's a test. And God bless him, uh, we'll give him a refuah uh, shlema. So he can continue uh, being a mezakeh rabim and uh, help Am Yisrael come back to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Uh, also for Ilui uh, Nishmat, Rav David Ben Nisan. Uh, also for Refuah Shlema for uh, Levana Bat uh, Sarah, Sarah Bat Levana. Um, David Ben Esriya, Doris Bat Jora. Uh, also, what's the name? Ilui uh, Nishmat or Refuah Shlema? Refuah Shlema for Esther, Bat Sipora, Also Dvora Bat Mercedes. Um, Elisheva Chaya Bat Sarah. And uh, all of Am Yisrael Bezat Hashem will have Refuah Shlema, Refuah Tanefesh, Refuah Taguf. So, Baruch Hashem, we've had a uh, phenomenal holiday. Uh, Baruch Hashem, the, uh, the best yet. Bezat Hashem, many more to come. Uh, it's uh, great to have a little bit of uh, quality time with the family, with the kids, uh, the wife, and uh, some friends, Baruch Hashem, in our uh, sukkah that uh, although wasn't... Uh, perfect with the air conditioning uh, in this 900 degree weather that you, that you have here in Florida it was a nice looking sukkah though it's a cool looking sukkah uh, next year we always have uh, expectations to even better next year um, aside from that we uh, learned a little bit of Torah finished a couple of svarim Baruch Hashem a few chidushim Zot Hashem, uh, a lot less than what I uh, hoped to do but Zot Hashem, hopefully because of the Kuya Rabin, we'll be able to do more now. But the biggest thing yet uh, is the feedback, Baruch Hashem, that we've been getting over the last few days from uh, the release of the uh, movie. Uh, Baruch Hashem, it's been a uh, fantastic feedback, even though it's only been really a couple of days of it being out there because of the holiday was really right after the release. Um, over 10,000 people have already watched it, and uh, Baruch Hashem, many of them have already contacted us. Either it's the first time they ever heard the story, or the first time they ever heard me, or uh, they've heard it, but it's just another way of listening to it. And already quite a few people uh, said that they're doing tshuva. Uh, but at the same token, Baruch Hashem, it's, uh, people are telling me about some of their similar issues, and it breaks your heart that so many people are going through so much pain and agony as a result of their own actions. And uh, it's not that we mean evil, it's not that we mean uh, to go against Hashem, but unfortunately when you don't serve Hashem full force, 100% of the time, it's only a matter of time before you go against Hashem. And that's really what's happening. That's really what Chazal was talking about when it says that in Gemara Maseret Sanhedrin, that the Mashiach is not going to come until there's a generation of fully righteous or fully wicked, meaning that there's, when the Mashiach comes, there's not going to be anyone left that's in the middle. 
It's either going to be someone that's an Eved Hashem, you're going to serve Hashem 24 hours a day, you're going to pray in the morning, you're going to pray in the afternoon, you're going to pray at night, you're going to be modest all the time, modest in the house, modest outside of the house, eat kosher in the house, eat kosher out of the house, kosher in the business, kosher in your house, kosher in your family, your mouth is going to be clean, your eyes are going to be clean, you're simply going to decide, that's it. Enough's enough. I'm going to do whatever I can to do the best that I can. No more excuses of sinning and giving myself all types of uh, excuses to continue sinning. I'm going to do my best. I'm not perfect, but I'm going to do my best. I'm not going to cheat. I'm not going to look for excuses of why, how to justify my sins. And you could be one of the tzaddikim that way. Or reshaim. What's the reshaim? The Rasha is the one that says, Ah, I know, Hashem is going to understand me. He created me this way. He created me with a desire to waste seed. So, okay, so I'll waste seed and Hashem understands. He created me with a desire to look at every woman, even though they're not my wife. So, Hashem understands. He created me with, you know, with money, so to be rich. So, of course, He understands that I have to be a Mechalat Shabbat. He created me this way, so therefore I'm this way. That's a Rasha. Rasha is not somebody that just murders people uh, in, uh, in, in daylight. Very few Rashaim in the world ex- uh, exist like that. Baruch Hashem. Rasha is not just uh, is not someone that steals money for a living and uh, has Ponzi schemes. Even though there's a new Ponzi scheme announced every day, and now uh, there's a guy that I follow, a reporter that I follow from time to time that reports Ponzi schemes. He's uh, recently reported that there's more... Ponzi schemes now than there have been in a while. Because the market's going down, so a lot of the thieves are being uh, exposed. But there's, not, there's still not that many. You're still talking about only a few hundred a year. It's nothing. So Rasha is not a guy that steals money, millions and millions of dollars. No. Rasha looks and acts sometimes just like you and me. Rasha comes in the form of a male, a female, old, young, Jewish, not Jewish. A rasha is simply, simply somebody that decided he does not want to improve himself. He is going to do whatever he feels like it, and God just has to accept it. Like someone told me a few days ago, I told him, what about you doing tshuva? He goes, nah, it's not for me. I said, why not? He goes, well, I don't agree with stoning for certain sins that it says in the Torah. I says, oh, well, it depends who's God. If you're God, then you have a right to agree or disagree. But if God is God, that right is no longer yours. You have no right to agree or disagree with what the Torah says. A Rasha thinks he does. A Rasha thinks he has the right to agree or disagree with the Torah. And he justifies his behavior that way. So it's very important, Rabotai, to simply make a decision once and for all. Either you're going to do tshuva or you're not. Either you're going to improve your life, regardless of whether you are today, whether you're wearing a kippah and tzitzit and a suit, or you have a kisui rosh mitvachat or not, you have to do tshuva. Why? Because you're still alive. There's definitely something that you have to improve on. I spoke to a woman today, God bless her, what test she has, Hashem Yilachem, Lo Aleinu Lo Aleichem, what test this woman has. But at the beginning of the conversation, she said, listen, I'm Haredit, completely religious, I have Kisui Rosh, Shabbat, Kashrut, everything. So why did Hashem give me all these different tests? I know it's from Hashem, she says, I know it's from Hashem, I just don't understand why. We spoke, I don't usually have such long conversations, but this poor woman is going such a big test. We continue talking. And throughout the conversation, every few minutes she says, oh wow, I have to do that. Oh wow, I have to do that. Oh wow, I have to do that. At the end of the conversation, she says to me, she goes, wow, I have a lot of tshuva to do. Meaning, I don't have any more complaints against Hashem. Thank God I'm still alive. That's the thing. That's the difference between someone that's righteous and someone that's wicked. Someone that's wicked simply thinks that they're perfect and Hashem was going to accept them no matter what. Someone that's righteous knows that they're not perfect and understands that they have to fix themselves. 
And that's not a problem. That makes you human. But that also makes you righteous if you know that you have to fix yourself. If you think that you're perfect, I'm in. If you think that you're perfect, I'm sorry to tell you, Torah calls you Rasha. Why? How could you possibly even think for a second that you have no more tshuva to do? Did you read the entire Torah? Did you go over the entire laws of the Torah? You know the entire Shuchan Aruch by heart? You know the entire Gemara by heart? How about this? You know at least the Machzor of Yom Kippur. Machzor of Yom Kippur, if you guys remember, on Oshana Rabba, I went, I went over with you. Machzor of Yom Kippur, just part of the Vidu Gadol. All the things that every one of us admitted to the sins, we admitted right before Neilah. As part of Neilah, we admitted Hashem, I'm a thief. Hashem, I'm a murderer. Hashem, I'm a this. Hashem, I'm a that. We're not saying Hashem uh, in case I did it. No, we're saying, Mamash, Hashem, I did it. I killed, I stole, I this, I that. Why? Why? I didn't steal, I didn't kill. He says, No, Torah says, if you didn't do it in this Gilgul, you definitely did it in the previous one. So you have to say, I'm sorry. You have to say, I'm sorry. So that's why, Rabotai Karim, a person that's alive has to understand they have a lot of work to do. A lot of work to do in order to be a tzaddik, in order to be a tzaddikah. So here, Bezat Hashem, hopefully, we could all start asking some questions of uh, some things that are going to uh, answer some things that perhaps you had on your mind, some things that perhaps other people have on their mind. I'm sure if you're asking it, if you have a question, other people also have questions. Bechavod, who wants to get started? Joshua. Shrecha v'ashrecha kecha. Yo, it's Rishon Rishon. Rishon Rishon Chashuv. It says the first one is the most important. So Bechavod, what's the quick question you have? He's creating one as we as, as we as, as, as we speak. Yeah. Uh, well, if... Um... What are, what are the, what are some of the the um, the measures or the signs that Hashem would use when He's getting fed up with a person's behavior? What does Hashem do in order to show a person that He's fed up with them? Yes. By the way, what what happened with the who's the guy? Did you see the guy who just came here, ate a little food, and then ran away? Ask for somebody named Israel. Yes, what? Ask for somebody named Israel. Oh, you didn't want a couple of shoes and just want some cookies. <laughs> Okay. At least the bracha. The bracha though. Somebody comes in, eats a cookie, leaves. It. It's kind of weird, no? I, know, I, 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 I thought I was the only one that caught that. So, okay, Hashem, I don't know. He was, asked us, well, he was asking us to do another guy named uh, Israel. Israel. Okay, Baruch Hashem. Israel. Israel is an Israel. Israel. Okay, 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 Yaakov, who's Yaakov? Yaakov is Am Yisrael. Yaakov also had a name Yisrael. Tell him, Yisrael is in the parasha. It's in the shiur. You're going to hear about Yisrael. Should have asked me. So anyway, tell him, is there questions and answers? Ask, sit down, ask the questions, he'll give you an answer. Uh, so anyway, Rabotai Yekarim, what are some of the signs that uh, Hashem is fed up with a person? The... Rambam writes that the uh, biggest punishment that a person can get while still alive in this world is the removal of their free choice to the extent where they no longer sense the need to do tshuva. That's the biggest punishment. Now punishment of what happens after this world we all have learned it already in Masechet uh, Gehenom, Shiur number 84. Baruch Hashem already approaching over 20,000 views on one of the channels. And I believe almost every single person that watched that Shiur is doing Tshuva for something. You cannot watch three hours about Gehenom and not do Tshuva. It's impossible. If you do, you watch the entire three hours and you don't do Tshuva, I'm going to send you a special medallion called Satum. You know what Satum is? Stuck, nothing. There's a, it's a, it's a, this person, hopeless. Hopeless. You know, like uh, sometimes there's a hole and it's shut with uh, all types of things. That's a person that doesn't do you after watching that you. But anyway, Rabotai Karim. Ma? 
אני באמצע שיעור חביב. אני באמצע שיעור חמוד. אתה לא יכול לעזור, מישהו זורק אותי עכשיו באמצע הרחוב, יהודי, שכל היום הוא עושה מצוות, זורק אותי עם כל התיקים שלי באמצע הרחוב, הרב שמואל רוצה לדבר איתך, לשאול אותך אם אתה יכול לעזור לי במקום להיות בו כמה ימים. אני לא יכול, אמסור, אני באמצע שיעור. אתה לא יכול? אשתבח שמו לעד. If I could answer a phone call and give him a room to stay, I don't know the guy from Adam, in the middle of the shul, you don't realize there's people here. Ay, abachti. Shem yachem. Just so you know, as a side note, there is a, uh, it's an opportunity to teach you a mitzvah. In America, if you ever went and visited Israel, you go to the uh, places of Haridim, you'll see it's very different than the places of religious people here in America, especially the modern Orthodox. When I lived in uh, Boca Raton, I was very surprised to see how uh, how much of an open door policy people had. They invite a lot of guests to their house. And that was, that's, a, that's a nice thing to do. And there's one guy, one Sadiq, his name is Isaac. And uh, he has mamash open door policy. Every week he has tens of people in his house, sleeping in his house, doesn't know them. And he has them in the house, and he has Baruch Hashem Bracha in his life. But in Eretz Yisrael, when I went to Eretz Yisrael, I was very surprised. In Arnof, most people didn't even say hello. So I asked my Rav, Bukhaba, I asked my love, how come they don't say hello? You know, I say hello, I'm like American. Like, hi. Hi. Shabbat Shalom. Nothing. Nobody's answering me, like as if I'm like, you know, see-through. Shabbat Shalom. I'm like, no, no little bal tshuva, like I'm happy about life all of a sudden. And I'm saying to these religious people, hello, Shabbat Shalom. Nothing. Nobody's, they won't even look at me. I'm like, what? Can they, can, they can tell I'm a bal tshuva? They can tell I was a murderer last week or something? Like, what's wrong with me? So Rav Chaim says, no, we, it's just not normal here to do that. I said, why not? Because in their mind, they're thinking, who are you? Why are you saying hello? What do you want from them? So why, why would I want something from them? I'm just saying hello. He says, it's not normal here. Why? He said, there's a lot of crazy people in the world. There's a mitzvah to bring guests into your house. And most people think that when they invite their friends... To their house to show off their meal show off the new kitchen show off the new uh, ceiling that's fulfilling the mitzvah of uh, bringing guests to your house it's a nice thing to do but it's not a mitzvah if your friend has food to eat has a place to be has a family he's not alone it's not a mitzvah to, to have him in your house it's a nice thing to do it's unity but it's not a mitzvah. Don't think for a second it's a mitzvah from the Torah. What's mitzvah from the Torah? Hosting guests that don't have some place else to be. Hosting guests that have some type of, perhaps he's, uh, you know, a, a widow, a divorcee, a convert, a poor person, uh, someone that's new in the community. Yeah, you invite them, that's a mitzvah. They don't have any place else to go. They're visiting, no problem, that's a mitzvah. But someone that lives next door to you, you're friends with them since high school, you know them for 20 years, and each week you guys take turns of who's going to cook, that's not a mitzvah. It's a nice thing to do, it's a nice gesture, but don't go up to Shemaim expecting Olam Abba for, for hosting your guest and feeding him your wife's chulint. It's not a mitzvah. It's a nice thing to do, it's not a mitzvah. Mitzvah is to host strangers in so many words, or people that don't have anywhere else to go. But Rav Ovadia says that that mitzvah, of Achnasat Orchim, you have to be very careful with it and almost don't do it unless you can check and verify who this person is. Don't just let anybody into your house. Why? He says there's a famous Maase, the famous story of what happened years ago. A certain person came into town that was known, uh, people looked at him, Mekubal. Someone, Mamash, looks like he just came from Mount Sinai. Has the tarbush, has the glima, everything. So, so, oh, it's Rabbi, where you come from, faraway city, 
sure, you can come to our house. So he came to this Sadiq's house and his wife, they didn't have any kids. And uh, they figured they're going to host this guy, this Mikuba in the house, bring some uh, Baha to the house. Come, come to the house, stay as long as you want. So the guy stays in the house for weeks, learning all day, all day, learning. Food once a day. The guy, Mamash, is fasting all day, learning all day. Once a week, once a day, he's, he's eating. So, wow, what a mikuda! What somebody so holy, somebody amazing. Why is such a? It's bringing such a blessing to the house. Hashem yirachem alenu from such people. Why? A few months later, the husband comes home. He sees the mikuda left. And the wife is crying. Honey, what happened? She says, I'm sorry. What sorry? What happened? He fooled me. What fooled you? What are you talking about fooled you? She says, please. I really am sorry. I'm so What? No, tell me what happened. He says, listen, he's been here for, for, for three months. I never see the guy eat. All he eats in the middle of the night, he gets something. He learns all day, learns all day. So I thought he's somebody special. And one day you weren't home. You went outside. You left me home with him. And uh, he looked at me and he says, you know who I am, right? I said, I didn't know what to say. He says, I'm Eliyahu Navi. I was shocked. He says, you don't have any kids here. I see it. You're three months of here. There's no kids. He says, yeah, we know. Oh, Hashem. Hashem didn't bless us with kids. He says, yeah, that's why he sent me here. He sent me here because the only way for you to have kids is if you sleep with me. And she says, the moment of weakness, I thought, okay, it's going to present Hashem, give me kids. That's what Hashem wants. I did it. But then he left and I realized I made a mistake. I'm sorry. A simple person didn't know right and left. She thought this guy looks like a mekubah. The whole thing is an act. The whole thing is an act. The whole thing is a show. Three months he's preparing, he's cooking this woman. Three months he's cooking this neighborhood. For what? For one disgusting, filthy sin. And that, Rabbi Vadya says, because of crazy people like that, you're not allowed to just let anybody into your house. There's no mitzvah there. You're not allowed to endanger your family just having strange people in your house thinking it's a mitzvah. Why? There's too many crazy people today. There's too many crazy people. Somebody sent me a message a month and a half ago. You know, they send messages, sometimes there's a name on the profile, but sometimes there isn't. This person doesn't have a name on it. He had like the letter N or something like that. Like, and then there's no name. People send questions every day, but this one got my attention. What's the question? He says, is it okay if I just look at pictures of kids naked, but I don't act on it? This is a question a person sends me at 2 o'clock in the morning. I start talking to the guy on the uh, text message. I find out the guy's supposedly religious. Supposedly religious, young. We're not talking about some uh, sick 60-year-old uh, that uh, lost his mind at some point. 20-something-year-old guy. He likes to look at kids. I said, you realize that what you're going to do, eventually you're going to make you a pedophile. You're going to do something about it. He goes, yeah, I know, but I can't help it. So inviting strangers to your house, thinking it's a mitzvah, it's not a mitzvah. If you cannot verify who they are, you cannot verify with somebody, this is a person that you know, this is a person that you vouch for, this is a person that uh, has his mind in his head, this is a person that's not some murderer, rapist, something. There's no mitzvah of inviting them at the house. Kadosh Baruch Hu runs the world, let him run the world. So... With that being said, that's why Rabotai, when some strange person puts you on the spot, tells you, talk to this guy that you don't know, and tell him that you know me, even though you don't know me, that you could actually host me in your house, in the middle of a shoe. What do you think I'm going to answer them? I'm sorry, in the middle of a shoe. <laughs> Who are you, Bechlal? I'm going to put you in my house with my uh, three little, ba four little babies. Oh, Hashem. Three little kids and a wife. It's all babies. I'll put you there, put everybody in danger of what? Because you, you think... Uh, uh, pressure me? Yeah. Get another cookie, go. 
People think that just because you have a keep on, you're obligated to be their servant. Doesn't work that way. Huh? He threw it on the table and he's left. The cookie or the keeper? The keeper. The chlech. The chlech is filth. He needs to learn some manners. No kavod for the Torah, no kavod for people in front of them come to Shiur Torah. Person like that, you're not at the host. Why? Puts your family in danger. Now, back to your question. How does a person know that a Kadosh Baruch Hu is very tired of him? Very tired of his nonsense. Rambam says that in El Chotshuva, the biggest punishment that a person can get while alive in this world is when Hashem decides he is not going to allow him to do tshuva. The Rambam writes, you have to have schut, you have to have merit to do tshuva. Not everybody's going to do tshuva. Mashiach is going to come, and I'm already telling you now, not everybody's going to do tshuva. You're going to know people that are going to get burned. You're going to know people that are not going to know, they're not going to do tshuva. Why? That's the way it is, unfortunately. Mitzrayim, how many people think left Mitzrayim? 20%. Chazaku Baruch. 20%, and that's a nice, generous estimate. The Midrash Me'am Lo'ez says 1%. 1% left. The other 99% Hashem killed. But general accepted Midrash, like Kvodo said, 20% left. What does that mean? 80% of Kadosh Baruch Hu killed them. Why? They didn't want to do tshuva. They didn't want to do tshuva. Hashem says, I don't want to do I don't want your tshuva then. You don't want to do it, I don't want you to do it then. So what happens is when a person gets tests from Hashem, Hashem gives him different signs. He starts losing money. In order for Hashem, Hashem make, takes his money away in order to make realize, hey, I'm in Shemaim, I'm taking away your money to get your attention. He doesn't get, the, doesn't get it, Hashem gives him another test, starts getting health problems. Doesn't get it, he gives him another test, marriage problems, loneliness problems, psychological problems. All types of problems, if the, in order for the guy to understand, in order for the woman to understand, it's time to say Shema Yisrael and accept Malchut Shemaim. It's time to accept that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is running the world and He's giving you signs that He wants more from you. You're not doing enough. You're not doing enough. You need to do more. What more? More. Whatever you're doing, do more. Yeah, but I don't know what I need to do. Okay, so go learn and you'll find out. Go. To our website, bezadashem.org, pick any lecture, or go to YouTube, Yaron Uven, pick any lecture, I bet you anything, you'll find a lecture that will teach you you need to do more. You have problems, Akadosh Baruch is giving you different things that you need to realize that you have to fix. But if the person doesn't get it, and instead of doing tshuva, he continues making more and more sins, and some of the sins are big sins, they're not sins that are small sins. They're big sins. They're sins of Chilul Hashem. He goes to uh, a, uh, you know, Mitzad Gava Hashem Yachem. Goes to one of these homosexual uh, parades. Like this Rasha Merusha went on BBC. Uh, just uh, today, yesterday, whenever, to publicize to the world that he is a homosexual dancer. But he dances with a kippah on to show his identity as a Jew person like that not only causes Chilul Hashem, it's also a Machti Rabim. person like that could easily get Hashem to a point where Hashem says, you know what, now I don't want your tshuva. So what happens? How does a person know that? The answer is, he doesn't know. Meaning, the person lives in the world without a feeling of remorse anymore. He no longer feels bad for sinning. He no longer feels like he needs to improve himself. He feels like he's perfectly fine. If you feel like you are perfectly fine, you are in danger. Most likely, none of you feel like you're perfectly fine. And the reason why is you're here. If you thought you were perfectly fine, you wouldn't come to the Shiur Torah that's going to give you some smacks on the head about Musar at 10 o'clock at night. But everybody that's not watching this you, some people are not watching it because they feel perfectly fine. Some people are just waiting for tomorrow for it to be on YouTube. But unfortunately, many people say, no, no, this rabbi, no, he's, uh, he's too hard. I'm okay already with tshuva. That's what somebody sent me the other day. 
learned our shiurim already for a couple of years, says, listen, he says to somebody else that said to me, and I heard the recording, so it's not like, uh, no, listen, now that I'm finished with tshuva, now I'm going to go learn real Torah. That's what he says. Now that I finish with tshuva, I'm going to go learn real Torah. Like, like we're learning dardasim. We're learning smurfs here. We're learning about Pokemon. He said, no, now, now that I finish with tshuva, I'm, uh, I'm going to go learn real Torah. So Rav Kanievsky, he's still learning tshuva, but he's, learning, uh, he's not learning real Torah yet. Rav Kanievsky wrote an entire book about tshuva. But you finished. You finished with tshuva. You're going to learn real Torah. People live in an illusion. And that's the thing. When a person has no feeling of remorse, when he makes sins, that is an indication that that person is mamash cut off. It's a very dangerous sign. Baruch Hashem, not many people feel that. Many people, even if they sin regularly, still feel a little bit of a pinch. For a second even. Their Jewish neshama still feels a little bit of a pinch that maybe there's something wrong with this. Every guy, whether male or whether uh, Jew or non-Jew, after he makes a sexual crime, whether it's he wastes seed or he's with a prostitute or anything like that, every single guy with no exception, unless he's one of those people, every guy feels bad the second it's finished. The second it's finished, all of a sudden it's like, ugh. Wow, well, like, why did I just do that? He's disgusted with himself. The second it's finished, he got uh, two minutes of pleasure, if it even lasted that long. And the second it's finished, like, ah, I can't believe I just did that. He doesn't even watch, he never even watched Wasting Seed Lectures. He doesn't even know it's the sun, but his neshama knows he just murdered millions and millions of neshamot. Every guy. Who doesn't feel bad? The person that's already too far removed. Where Kadosh Baruch Hu says him, he's never going to do tshuva. I don't want his tshuva. But those are very few people. Baruch Hashem. Which means, Rabotai Karim, that many people can do tshuva. If you're alive, you can do tshuva. And Hashem wants your tshuva. But in general, the biggest sign is, the worst sign is that. The other smaller signs are, like I said, where your life is getting more and more difficulties. You see that no matter what you do, everything keeps going wrong. You go into a business, your business fails. You start something else, it fails. You start something else, it fails. You start something else, you keep failing, you keep getting fired. What do you think? I mean, even if you're an idiot, even if you're an idiot and you made those mistakes on purpose, you wouldn't fail that much. That means there's something here, there's Yad Hashem here. When I first started in my business, in the beginning it was tough, but then once I started hitting, the, the ball, Mamash, I started the business. Everything that was dust, I turned to gold. Every stock we picked went up. But I went up like other people, 5, 10, 20% and you're happy. Talking about buying something, it went up 500%. Like ridiculous returns. The market dropped 30%. We made over 70% for our clients. Something ridiculous. Everything worked out. We had a company called Priceline. Look at the t- stock today. I think it's like a thousand dollars. I don't know. I haven't watched the market in a long time. It's like a thousand dollars. We bought it for a dollar. We didn't keep it until we sold it at twenty-five. But still, the point is, twenty-five times your money, you're happy. Everything turned to gold. More time passes. Lots of money. Lots of clients. Lots of employees. Lots of stuff. But then suddenly, Akadosh Baruch Hu, as the movie said, oh, suddenly everything started going wrong. All of a sudden, the investments are not working out. All of a sudden, some of the investments start collapsing. All of a sudden, some clients that I made the millions leave for no reason. Why are you leaving? Oh, I don't know. I'm just going to start something new. What do you mean? But I took your account from nothing to millions. Yeah, yeah, thank you. But the whole point of me doing this is for you to stay with me. So he goes, yeah, maybe I'll come back later on. Okay, so it's one guy, then another guy, then another guy, then another guy. Before you know it, in one week, 30, 40 million dollars of clients left for no reason. You know how hard people work just to get one million dollars of client money? 30 million in a week. Gone. 
One day I show up, 15 and 14 employees are missing. I said, where are the employees? Oh, they all went to this other firm up the block. I'm like, what do you mean they all went to the other firm? Because they'll quit. 14 employees in one day? What, am I killing these people with a wig? What happened? Nothing. All of a sudden, everything goes wrong. Then the investments go down. Then the market collapses. Then I do a deal. I'm going to try to sell the firm. I find this investor. He's going to buy the firm. He's going to buy 20% of the firm. Valuation of $49 million, $50 million, something like that. We do a deal. Deal collapses. I end up, instead of getting money, instead of getting a few million dollars, instead of getting $4.9 million investment, I end up losing $500,000. Mamash, if, if you would have made all these mistakes on purpose, it wouldn't have been as many. Meaning what? Yad Hashem. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, no, no. Now, no matter what you do, you're not going to succeed. Before, no matter what you did, you're going to succeed because I decided. Now, no matter what you do, you're not going to succeed. Why? Because I decided. Until you come back and say, Shema Yisrael. Hashem, I'm sorry. Full tshuva. But people don't get it. So what happens? Hashem sends more signs. You lost money, you didn't get it. Now you have other problems. Now your wife is sick. Now your son is sick. Now your car broke down. Now you got fired. Now you got this. Now there's an article on the paper about you. Now somebody's accusing you of things you never did. Now this, now that. What do you think? What do you think? It happens for nothing. You have bad luck? Nobody has bad luck. It's a shame. Even a broken clock is right twice a day. If everything is wrong all the time for you, that means HaKadosh Baruch Hu is looking for your attention. And he's running out of patience. You stop, you don't listen, you continue treating him like a casually, it'll get worse. That's why when I spoke to a few people today, I told him, listen, you want this to stop? Yes, yes, you have to do everything I said. No, can I just know everything? Everything. No, but it's hard. Okay, so stay in problems. Stay in problems. Go, stay. In. I'm telling you this is what you have to do. You don't want to do it, Chabot, go, continue suffering. Yeah, but it's hard. Okay, is it hard or is it, is it harder to do uh, than this or is it harder to suffer? Which one do you want, suffering or to do, to do tshuva? No, it's definitely harder to suffer. Okay, so do tshuva instead. That's the way it works, Rabotai. And that's really the real answer. Anyway, it tells you, no, no, maybe you should uh, buy this band or do this special prayer and everything's going to be fixed. It doesn't work that way. It may help a little bit. Like, for example, and we we'll go to the next question. People say oh, about Tikkun Klali. Rabbi Nachman Breslev, Allah Shalom, may Tikkun Klali. Certain set of Tehilim that you read in order that help the Pgama Brit issue. People think that if you read Tehilim, that's going to fix all your sins. No, that's not what Tikkun Klali is for. Tikkun Klali Rabotai is to read it in order to wake up your sleepy neshama to realize how bad the sin is so you could finally do tshuva. The Tikkun itself is not tshuva. The Tikkun is to wake your neshama up to now start doing tshuva. By realize how wrong you were, crying about it, Give tzedakah for it. Stop it. Learn about it. The tikkun klali, it's not, oh, it's a get out of jail free card. You, you read uh, 10, 15 teilim and you're finished. All the millions and millions of neshamot that you murdered in cold blood. Oh, no, they're okay now. Thank you very much, Abba. We're going to find somebody else that's going to support us. No, Habibi, what do you think? It's going to be so easy to fix it? You read some teilim and that's it. A half a billion neshamot you destroyed last week is, uh, is, is fixed. The tikkun klali is to wake up your sleepy neshama to realize how bad the sin was and now you're going to do tshuva. It's to wake up that neshama. Go read that book that I gave thousands of copies already, Baruch Hashem, hundreds at least of copies, Holy Nation by Breslov. See what it says over there. Anyone that reads that book, Ashra Ba'ashach El you read from Shukhan Aruch, from Poskim, from Chassidim, from Rabbi Nachman, from all different... Uh, uh, tzadikim or throughout all the generations of what Gamabrit really means. And you realize, okay, Tikkun Klali is to wake your neshama up, not to fix everything, but that's what people think. People think that Hashem is a frail. He's uh, some uh, 
for, I don't know how you say file, sucker or something like that. You could just pretty much murder millions of people for, for, for 20 years straight, but you say, I'm sorry one time and everything goes away. It doesn't work that way, Rabotai. Tshuva is hard work, but Hashem wants it. And He's giving you the opportunity to do it. And I promise you, once you decide to take action, all of a sudden, Tshuva becomes easier. Why? Because you've already did the hard part, which is beat the Yetzirah to convince yourself that you need to do this. You need to do Tshuva, that's it. Once you know you need to do Tshuva and you start doing something about it, you start learning every day, start praying every day, start doing mitzvot every day, little by little things become easier. But so long as you deny the fact that you need to do tshuva, pretend like everything's okay, and you're okay, and Hashem is going to understand you because you were born in a certain neighborhood, or you're short, or you're long, or you're black, or you're white, or whatever you are, as long as you give yourself these excuses, unfortunately the situation will only get worse because you'll never do tshuva. So Bezat Hashem, this gives uh, people chizuk to understand that uh, Hashem wants your tshuva. Don't push Him to the extent where he has to increase the signs and make it more difficult for you. He doesn't want to do it. When you cry from pain, he cries from pain. But sometimes you have to slap your kid in order to wake him up. Even though it hurts you even more to slap your kid, you have to sometimes slap him to wake him up. So the Chavo, next sentence, next question. So, <clears throat> you said that Hashem sometimes doesn't want a person's tshuva, right? Ken. So, if Hashem doesn't want a person's tshuva, what's the purpose of that person's life anymore like i mean if he can't do tshuva he can't do anything he's just gonna get worse and worse okay. so what's the point of him being alive anymore fantastic question the question is if a person hashem already decided this guy i don't want his tshuva what's the point of leaving him alive do you answer do you asked it because i didn't say it and for for a reason but hashem wants you to know it this is scarier than my shiul if you understand what I'm about to tell you, this is scarier than Shiro by Genom. Every Wednesday, every Wednesday, Am Yisrael reads Teilim that starts El Nekamot Hashem, El Nekamot Ofia. The God of vengeance is God. The God of vengeance has arrived. Every Wednesday. That's the Teilim you read. Meaning that vengeance, revenge, is not yours to take. Somebody goes against you, don't take revenge. Hashem takes revenge. But sometimes Hashem takes revenge against Reshaim. Day comes, Hashem takes revenge. There's certain people that are machtia rabim, that cause other people to sin. People that have these nightclubs. People that steal money from people. People that cause the public to sin. Missionaries and things of that nature. When the day comes that Hashem takes revenge, it's not just in the next world. When Hashem decides that this person, he does not want his tshuva because this person has murdered too many souls. He has caused too many people to leave Judaism. Like this one Rasha that I met in New York, he says that he takes pleasure in getting Jews to stop keeping Shabbat. Rasha Merusha Mamash told me this. I told him from now on, every time I pray, I'm going to pray for you to die. I'm going to have your face in my head when I'm going to pray for you to die. This is what you like. You don't want to keep Shabbat yourself. That's your problem. But you want other Jews to stop keeping Shabbat. Why do you care if they keep Shabbat? So that means you're evil. You're evil. I'm obligated to pray for you to die. That's in our Amidah three times a day. We pray for certain people to die. Those people are those people. Now, there's certain Rishayim that want people to leave Hashem. Hashem gives them a chance, another chance, another chance to do tshuva. Eventually, they run out of chances. So there's a pasuk at the end of Parashat Vayet Hanan. says, Meshalem el sonav el panav la'avido. He pays his haters cash to their face to destroy them. It's at the end of Parashat Vayet Hanan. One before last verse. Meaning that those haters, those sinners, he pays them. What does he pay them? They did a few mitzvot at some point in their life, even if it was not intentional. They saw a homeless guy and they gave him $5. Even though it wasn't for the sake of the Torah, they wanted to be a nice person. And they gave him $5 to a homeless guy. 
they gave somebody a ride they uh, you know they did all types of things that Hashem has to pay them for it he pays them reward in this world in order to destroy them meaning that even though he does not allow them to do tshuva he allows them to continue living why so they can make more sins so their punishment will even be worse he takes revenge against those people to me when I first heard this I started shaking when I was in school a little kid I wasn't so big small little kid one time they said that this guy was a little taller than me wants to fight me I said, okay let's fight I was a little, little tough guy let's fight but then another time they told me this group of people want to fight me I said okay let's not fight well I'm not stupid tough guy but not stupid group of 20 kids want to fight me what am I gonna do with that so you get scared Akadosh Baruch Hu is not 20 people If HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, I'm going to fight you, I'm going to take revenge against you, you, my friend, are in dear trouble. Hell is not enough to describe the trouble that you're in. If HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, you are his enemy. And that's what happens, Rabbi Sometimes a person makes fun of Hashem, desecrates Hashem's name to the point where Hashem says, I'm going to allow you to live. Why? So you can make more sins, so that way I'm going to punish you even more. Hashem Yirachem Aleinu. Just the thought of that, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu says there are certain people that he takes revenge against, is a nightmare. The Gemara, Masechet Gitin, has a few examples of this. One example is Titus. One of the Goim kings that desecrated the Bet HaMikdash. After he desecrated the Bet HaMikdash, he took a zona, a prostitute, and he did the act on top of a sefer Torah inside the Kodesh Kodeshim. He went inside the Kodesh Kodeshim where the Kohen Gadol would pray and speak to Hashem. He went inside the Kodesh Kodeshim, put a sefer Torah, and made the act of disgusting, filthy act with a zona inside there. Meaning, now you're not doing that because you're an atheist. If you're an atheist, what's the point? If you don't believe in God, what's the point? Who, who are you making mad by doing this? You already killed a bunch of Jews. It's not like they're watching this. You killed them already. Meaning, he's doing this. Titus, Titus is doing this because he believes in Hashem. And he dafka wants to make him mad. Takes a sefer Torah. Takes a zona, makes the act that's despicable and disgusting inside the Kodesh Kodeshim. After he leaves, he goes into his boat and the whole boat starts shaking because there's mama tsunamis in the ocean. Titus believes in Hashem. Says, ah, this God of the, uh, this God of the Jews, he's only uh, powerful in the ocean. Why? Because he killed the generation of Noah with water. So he says to God, Fight me on land. Let's see if you're strong. Meaning he thinks he's in the same strength as Hashem. Because fight me on what? You don't have any power. You only have power in the ocean. Fight me on land. Let's see what you do against me on land. That's how stupid some people get to. They want to fight Hashem. Hashem gives them tests. They say, nah, it's a incident. It's a coincident. It's a dissident. It's all types of this. It's just not Hashem. Everything except Hashem, they say. So this idiot, Rashame Rushat Titus says this to Hashem. The second he said it, Hashem listened. He says, Oh, you want me to fight you on land? No problem. I'm not even going to fight you. I'm going to send you my smallest creation, and that's going to fight you. What? The smallest creation we knew at the time is a mosquito. The second he said it, the ocean calmed down. As soon as he got to land with the rest of his people, thinking he's powerful, a little mosquito entered into his nose. Oh, you know, sometimes it happens. You run in the street. Sometimes something comes in your nose. You don't really know what it is. Well, that's what happened. A little mosquito went inside. Only this time, unlike most people, it dies. Usually as it hits your nose, it dies. In his case, no, this mosquito was worked out. It didn't die. Where did it go? It went all the way inside the brain. 
It went inside his brain and started sucking the blood out of his brain. And for the next several years, Titus couldn't deal with it. Always, there was always something in his head. He's in pain. He doesn't know what's going on. One day he passes by the, uh, by the uh, market and he hears people, the jackhammer with the hammer, tach, 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 and all of a sudden the headache went away. He goes, oh, what? So what's going on in my head? It stopped. He brought all those people to, to his castle. Make all the noise possible because when you make noise, I don't have the headache anymore. So a few of the people were Jewish. He says, are we going to get paid for it? He says, what paid for it? Not only is your God punishing me, but you want to get paid for it? He knew it was Hashem. He wasn't stupid. But after a little while, what happened? The mosquito got used to the noise. The mosquito got used to the noise and went back to work, continued eating his brain. Over the next seven years, it sucked his brain out until he said, I can't take it. Open my head and take it out, whatever is in there. When they opened, the Gemara says, when they opened his head, the mosquito was the size of a dove. He died. But the mosquito was the size of a dove. A dove, Gabotai. A dove, not a mosquito. A dove, that's how much it ate. Now this wasn't finished. This was just this world. The Gemara says, Onkilus, Onkilus Agel. I love a shalom. Did a seance, brought Titus in a seance, asked him, Where are you? He says, I am in Genom. He goes, What are they doing to you over there? He says, Every day, because I desecrated the Bet Mikdash, they burn me alive, spread my ashes all over the ocean, because I thought that I could escape Hashem. So, in my will, I asked them to spread my ashes all over the ocean so Hashem can't find me. So that's what Hashem, that's how stupid he was, this guy. He believes in Hashem, but his own Hashem, his own ideology. So I told him to spread my ashes in the ocean. So Hashem does that. They burn me alive, spread my ashes all over the ocean, and then they put me back together. And then they burn me alive again, and over and over and over again until infinity. It'll never end. That's Madoh Geinom, Madoh Shvish Geinom, the seventh level of Geinom. That whoever gets in, the Gemara in Masechet Rosh Hashanah, page 17a says, whoever gets in never gets out. Guess what? A Mechalel Shabbat B'Fareshia also gets the same Genom. You don't have to desecrate the Bet HaMikdash to go into that section. You drive on Shabbat, don't do Tshuva, you go into that Genom. You waste seed, you don't do Tshuva, you go into that Genom. You go with a married woman, you don't do Tshuva, you go into that, you're going to be best friends with Titus. Why am I telling you this? So you don't go to Genom. So you go to Gan Eden, where I want to go. You want to go to Gan Eden? Who wants to go to Gan Eden? Raise your hand. Everybody wants to go to Gan Eden? You want to go to Gan Eden? Which one wants to go to Gan Eden? Okay, who wants to go to Gan Eden? Raise your hand with Titus. Raise your hand. Oh, nobody? No takers? That's why I tell you. That's why I tell you this horrible stuff. So that's why Rabotai. Hashem is not a joke. A person that sins and gets to that point, Hashem can take revenge against that person in this world and the next. It's very scary. When you think about it, it's very scary. I heard it, I started shaking, I started crying. Bemet. Why? The more you know, the more you realize how real this is. So that's why, Rabotai, it's very, very important to take tshuva seriously. Everything you know, do it. You can't do it, try again tomorrow. Try again the next day. Never, ever give up. You can do it. Everybody can do tshuva. If I can do tshuva, you can do tshuva. Next question. Yes, Bechavo, next deal. Uh, someone on the seventh level of Gehenim never leaves, like for desecrating Shabbos and like wasting seed. Like, what do you mean by never doing Teshuvah for wasting seed? Like, let's say someone, he's like 20 years old, he wastes seed all the way to 40. And then at 40, he stops, but then dies at 42, but he's like planning to like stop forever. Did he stop doing, did he start he, doing Teshuvah he, before he died? I mean, he just stopped. He didn't do anything else but stop. Did he stop because Hashem said so? Or he stopped because uh, the uh, not his, the health his, benefits. His, his member doesn't work anymore. Because he ruined it. <laughs> not because erectile dysfunction. He uh, stopped because Hashem. Oh, he stopped for two years. He stopped because uh, because Hashem said so. That's already chuba. All right. That already puts him in a different chamber. He's not absolved from the sin, but he's definitely uh, in a, in a degree of chuba, and he's not going to go to Gainum forever. Baruch Hashem. So, I'm going to add something. A chidush. To your question, because it's very important to know this since we're talking about tshuva, 
The Gemara in Masechet Yoma, page 86, says the Aftara in uh, Parashat Azinu says that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives us the commandment of doing tshuva. Doing tshuva. And it says, Shuvah Yisrael ad Hashem Elokecha that uh, return Am Yisrael to Hashem. And then it says later on again, take word with you and return to Hashem. But the return is spelled two different ways. One in singular, one in plural. Meaning in the beginning it says, return, do tshuva to like one person. But the second time it mentions it in the, per- in the verse, it mentions it to a lot of people. So the Gemara says, this is showing that there is two different types of tshuva. There is tshuva from fear of going to gain home, fear of losing money, fear of uh, punishment of all kinds. And then there's tshuva from love. Loving Hashem. Now, Rabbi Nachman Breslev, Allah Shalom, wrote in Lekute Maran, he says, Alvai, the tzaddikim in my generation, will do tshuva from fear. Even though it's lower, alvai, they all do it from fear. Why? Because to get to a level of loving Hashem is almost unheard of for most people. In his generation, a couple of hundred years ago, needless to say about our generation. But then there's a fantastic chidush one of my dear friends gave me. This chidush is worth a million dollars monthly, not one-time payment. Monthly. We take payments though. He says the Zera Shimshon. Zera Shimshon says, Why does the Gemara mention love and fear? Why does the Torah mention singular and plural? What do we learn here? The Gemara is telling us that if you do tshuva purely from fear, all of your sins that you did turn to accidental. The purposeful sins that you did. You wasted seed on purpose. No one forced you to do it. You did it yourself. You did it on purpose. So that wasting seed that you did on purpose, it turns to accident. It's still a sin, but it's not the same level. You're in a level of about tshuva. You're not going to gain home forever, but you're still going to have to go to gain home for it. Why? It's a sin. You killed somebody. So even if you say, I'm sorry, the guy's still dead. You can't undo that. That's tshuva from fear. Tshuva from fear means... That you're afraid of going to gain home, you're afraid of getting punished, you're afraid of being lonely, you're afraid of losing your money, you're afraid of Hashem, and therefore you do tshuva. Eh, but needless to say, it, there's still some scars. Somebody stabbed the guy, even though he said, I'm sorry, and he even paid for the surgery, there's still some scar over there. Right? But now we just heard about gain home, we don't want to go to gain home. So Kadosh Baruch Hu gave us a get out of jail free card. What? Tshuva me'ava. To do tshuva from loving Hashem. But then Rabbi Nachman Breslev says, Yeah, but who's going to do tshuva from Ava? Who's going who's gonna to do it? Only the tzaddikim barely get there. So the Zera Shimshon gives us a chidush of all chidushim. He says the following. The difference is, Rabotai Yekarim, tshuva from Yira. When you fear Hashem, and therefore you do tshuva, what happens? You understand that a sin is no good, you understand that a sin is no good, and therefore you start learning, you start doing yourself. Whatever you can do, you do. You learn about Shabbat, you keep Shabbat. You learn about Gamma Breed, you start keeping your Breed. You learn, whatever you do, you do yourself. But he says, Tshuva me'ava, to love Hashem. How can you show you love Hashem? How can you show you love Hashem? By loving His children. How it's Tshuva ba'ava, Tshuva from love, is when you cannot tolerate the fact that so many of Hashem's children are like orphans that don't even know they have a father. They don't know who Hashem is. All of these kids that Hashem have don't even know what tshuva is. They don't know nothing. And it makes you sick to your stomach that Hashem is looking for His kids, but His kids are not looking for Him. So what do you do? You go do kiruv. He says, you do kiruv five minutes a day, five hours a day, the whole day, the whole night. Whatever you do, that's tshuva me'ava. That's showing Hashem that you love Him. 
And that, Rabotai Yekarim, can take the worst possible sins you've ever made and not only erase them, but actually turn them into mitzvot, the Gemara says. When it's only tshuva from fear, you're turning the bad sin into accident. Accident, it's good, it's better, but it's still not like 100% kosher badats. You're still considered a little bit of a murderer. You go up to Shema and say, oh yeah, here's the murderer. Yeah, he didn't kill, accident, accident. He only killed, you know, accidentally killed 50 million people, accident. But now you help people do tshuva, you send them the movie that we just made. You send it to your whole list every week. You send all the shuim every week. You get people to come to the shuim every week. You actively try to help people do tshuva, even if you don't succeed. But you try. Hashem says, all of the sins you've made, they now turn into mitzvot. So imagine, average teenager, by the time he gets to 25 years old, probably killed 20 civilizations. Imagine all of those sins turning into mitzvot. He shows up to Shemaim, they start singing, Tzadik Yesod Olam. Why? Well, said Tzadik, why? How many mitzvot this kid has? Look how many mitzvot this kid has. They think he's Moshe Rabbeinu of the generation. Why? All the mitzvot. What mitzvot? I barely catch uh, my on time. No, you did Shuvah, you did Kiruv. All your sins turn into mitzvot. Mamash, a get out of jail free card with a bonus. Whoever doesn't take advantage of such a bonus, is, Mamash, is going to curse the day where they were born. Why? You show up to Shemaim, they're going to show you, listen, you know that phone that Hashem gave you? You know that finger that Hashem gave you, the right finger, the left finger? If you were to use that phone with the right finger, left finger, and just press forward, you would have been like Moshe, higher than Moshe Rabbeinu. But since you didn't, you're like uh, kind of uh, similar to Bilam. What's the difference? Finger. You know that money that Hashem gave you? Instead of buying that other watch, you could have actually helped donate that money to Kiruv. How people do tshuva. Oh, you didn't? You bought the watch? Okay, the watch is still there. And um, your tshuva, you still have to suffer for the sin. So, 9,000 years in Gainom. Yeah, but I'm going to go to Gan Eden. Yeah, after 9,000 years. You are going to go to Gan Eden. We promise you, you're going to go to Gan Eden. But uh, 9,000 years from now. Why? Because you didn't press the finger. Because you didn't donate a few dollars. Because you did not care about Hashem's children. That's how easy it is. That's how easy it is. You have to care about Hashem's children. This Rabotai, when I saw this, I said, this mamash must be said. It's so easy that it would be mamash busha to not do it. Next question. You're shocked? Are you guys in, in, in shock? You're in good shock, bad shock, middle, middle shock? Now, We always talk about these interesting subjects, but we need some ochachot. I'm going to give you something I got some weeks ago. I never publicized it yet, but I'm going to publicize it now as a gift to start off the year. Now, Baruch Hashem, this job of getting Akadosh Baruch Hu's children to come back and understand that he is the Melech Malchei Amlachim is not an easy job. Because the whole time you're doing it, people call you crazy. Why do you care? Because Hashem's kids. Okay, let's go find... People have all types of questions. But the reason why is because of two things. Number one, I know what Gainom looks like. And I'm afraid for people. My little story that you saw, the movie, it's not the whole story. I hope you guys know that. It's little tidbits of the story. There's certain things that I didn't say, certain things I won't even say. What I said is enough to get deliver the point. That's what Gainom a little bit on this earth looks like. So since I know, I'm afraid that it's going to happen to other people. That's one motivation for me to help people come back to Hashem before it's too late. The second motivation, Rabotai Karim, is that I love Hashem, but... More so than that, I know how much Hashem loves you. And how much He's going to give you a gift that keeps on giving if you only do tshuva. 
Now, I get to see, Baruch Hashem, lots of miracles, because I get to see Hashem at work all the time. Because people that listen to some of the shiurim, many of them, many of them Baruch Hashem, they do tshuva, and sometimes it takes a week, sometimes it takes six months, sometimes it takes six years, it takes a little while sometimes, sometimes right away, but you start seeing their life turn into one big miracle. So you get to see a lot of miracles that other people don't get to see. And you know that it's happening, and you know exactly why it's happening, but you stay quiet just watching a shem. It's like, this is so great to watch. It's like you have front row tickets to see HaKadosh Baruch at work. I'm going to give you front row tickets to something I saw with my own eyes. This is a letter one of my students sent me. Her name is Ruth. She lives in South America. Ruth, God bless her, and her husband. They keep Shabbat, they keep mitzvot. Got a few kids. But they had some problems. They had some marriage problems, kids problems, all types of problems. Recently, she started watching our shurim, started getting some more chizuk, Baruch Hashem, but again, it doesn't solve all the problems. She volunteered to help do Ikiruv. She, uh, anyone that watched the, uh, the movie with the Spanish uh, subtitles, she's the one that uh, did the subtitles, Baruch Hashem. Now, she saw that there's more and more people that need to learn this truth. So she started looking at other shiurim and started putting subtitles and helping in all different ways. To, to, to help uh, Am Yisrael do tshuva. Now, none of you and no one that's watching this knows who the Ushi is, so that's why I'm not saying the last name. But this is a letter that she wrote, and I'm going to read it to you. My son was very, very bad some time ago. Since he was born nine years ago, he was cursing at everything, hitting us, throwing things, problems at school and life in our home was genom. We had to do something, but what? We prayed. I prayed to Hashem to show me the, the, the correct path. What did I do wrong? I continue asking Him that once again and couldn't reach any answers. Years passed and we continued suffering more and more doctor appointments, more and more medicines, more medicines that didn't do anything to him and actually made him even worse. Until one day, last week, this is a couple of months ago, our son got an overdose of medication, Shem Yachem. The weird thing is that the maximum dosage of that medication per kilogram is 1,500 milligrams. He was only taking 500 milligrams and he overdosed with it. Who would have known that? He could have died. I was called from the school to pick him up and I, when I reached there, he was crazy. He was hiding under the table, half naked, crying out with eyes closed, dozed like he's doped. Still with strength though. It was awful to see because the doctors have to give him an injection to be able to calm him down. And get him in an ambulance to take him to the emergency room. When the medication was doing effect, it was like he was like a statue, like a crazy drug person, not moving, not even his eyes. I was just so sad to see him like this. My little child. My heart was broken into pieces. After many hours, the effect was getting off of his system. And he was fighting and groaning for everything. The nurses told me it was a normal thing after the medicine they had given him. After some time, my husband and I went home with my other three-year-old son. And he remained in the hospital. The next day, I was with him all day until he was normal again. When we got off the, the hospital and reached home by the afternoon, my husband and I talked. I felt so bad. That for all that happened, I knew it was our fault, meaning the parents' fault. So I told my husband, I don't want to lose a child. Let's do this. 
let's keep a pact of Avraham Avinu. Both of us. You don't waste seed and lose semen in vain. And I'll, ta- I'll take care of your eye and take care of your eyes and study Torah every day. And I'll be with you every single time you want me to be with no excuses. Of course, you know that it's hard for me because of certain medicine that she's taking. But it's a deal. It was Friday. We went to the synagogue while the kids stayed at home with the nanny. On Shabbat, when we were reading the Torah, I realized that it was Parashat Kititze. I told my husband, no way. In that parasha, Moshe Rabbeinu tells the people when there's a man that is wasting seed at night, he has to go away outside of the campsite and then into a mikveh to get it again and again and again back into the camp because the campsite has to be holy. Also, the same parasha talks about the rebel son, the wayward child. If this is not a message from Hashem, what is? From that day, they decided to keep this brit. He's going to learn Torah and watch his eyes. And she commits that she'll be with him whenever he wants her, as long as she's Torah. Allowed to be. This is what she writes, Rabotai. You can't make this stuff up. I'm going to give you the letter. We'll publish it on our website. From that day on, we're not talking about six months later. We're not talking about six years later. Said that day, our son was a completely different kid. A complete different kid. It's like the devil he had in him went away. He almost doesn't curse at all anymore. He used to call me a prostitute, Hashem Yachem. He called his mom a prostitute. Nine year old kid, what does he know, Bichlal? He used to call me a prostitute all the time and damned. It hurt me so much. He hit us and he couldn't even talk and have a com- you couldn't even talk and have a conversation with him because it was like his capability for reasoning was completely gone. He would put his hands in his ears and start singing. Now, after we did this bleed, same day, that Shabbat, now he gets angry, but it's a different angry. He doesn't throw a plate in your face. He hits his fist against his leg or his foot on the floor saying, it's not fair, mommy, like a normal boy. He's a sweet little kid. He apologizes right away. He's not a hypocrite. He's not, uh, he's not hyperactive. He's another boy. He's the boy that was inside trying to get out, but we didn't let him. Because of all the tum'ah that he had on him, the poor little kid, Hashem Rachem. When a person thinks, she says, when a person thinks that he wastes semen in vain, it doesn't affect him or his family, all of that is nonsense. And I'm telling you by experience, Hashem showed us in the hard way because we lived with a devil kid for nine years, going from one doctor to another, even going to another country to make a diagnosis and losing so much of our time and lives fighting this and crying all over this crazy life of ours. It was impossible to teach him anything. He was the oppositionist. He was cruel. But inside, sometimes, he showed us that he was a sweet little boy inside. I knew it was somewhere inside him. But what I didn't know was that what it didn't let me get out It didn't let this boy get out of the jail was us the parents we the parents had built around them because of our big sin all those demons were on him now they're dying they're going away these demons as we're taking care of Avraham's pact the Brit of Avraham and my husband is studying Torah and I'm trying to make more mitzvot or improve the ones that I make thank you Hashem for showing me the way you can't make stories like this up, Rabotai. The first time I heard this, I, I, I read this, I started crying. Rabotai, this is not a chidush. 
Darizal says there's no such thing as crazy people. People that have lost their state of mind, lost control, it's as a result of different things that are causing them to do it, different demons. Unfortunately, sometimes those things are made by their own parents. And the Sfarim HaKadoshim say that when a man wastes seed, that seed is his children. And those children take revenge against him by going against his own living kids. Because he says, how come you created us without bodies, but they have bodies? And that's why there's a minhag that has standing in Yerushalayim till this day that when the father dies, the kids are not allowed to ter- take him inside the cemetery because they're afraid the religious community is afraid that the father has wasted seed in his life and during that moment that they're burying the body those uh, those that seed those uh, Shedim have the power to kill the kids the living kids so until this day till this day the kids are not allowed to bury the body in Yerushalayim When a man wastes seed, he doesn't think that he's doing anything wrong. He goes, I don't even have kids. I'm only 18, 19 years old. Habibi, one day you're going to be 28. One day you're going to be 38. You're going to have kids. What do you think? Those, those ones that you created and destroyed, they're not going to stay with you? They don't leave. You created them unless you do tshuva. How you do tshuva? First and foremost, stop. First and foremost, stop immediately. Second of all, say I'm sorry to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Third, learn about the topic. We have a, we have a uh, playlist on YouTube, on the website called Wasting Seed Pagama Brit. Watch every single lecture on that list. There's probably 40 lectures there. Long ones, short ones. Watch it over and over and over again. A little bit of every day. A little bit, five minutes, ten minutes, an hour. Whatever you can every day until you get it into your mind. That you know this all by heart. And even then continue. You always, this is the type of thing that every guy needs chizuk. Even women need to listen to this stuff. Because they're going to have kids. Somebody's going to have to teach the kids. And they also have to understand that when they walk around imadist, they're causing guys to look at them. They're partners to the sin. People don't understand the type of damage they bring to their life when they go against the Kadosh Baruch Hu with something that seems innocent, private. What's the big deal? Here we have a Isha Kedusha that's mamash, frum, but didn't realize that to be frum, it takes a little bit more than just keeping Shabbat. It takes a little bit more than just eating kosher, putting kisu rosh. Doing tshuva rabota is, 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 is something you do every day, no matter where you are. Rav Kanievsky, Shichye, is still doing tshuva every day. The bigger the tzaddik, the more tshuva he does every day of his life. There's no such thing as someone at tzaddik and not a baal tshuva. There's nothing to be ashamed of. It's something to be proud of. But if a person takes, seri- takes this seriously, he can do anything. You could literally cure any problem you have in your life if you bring kedusha to your life. But if you're wasting seed, if you're imadist, if you're stealing, if you're going against Hashem by chilul shabbat and all things like that, no blessing in the world is going to help you because you're cursing yourself. That's why when people go to specific tzaddikim, they don't always get a blessing. Somebody came to Rav Kanievsky not too long ago, asked for a blessing. Rav Kanievsky didn't give him a blessing. Why? Because the guy's a Mechalit Shabbat. Somebody went to uh, the, the uh, Rav um, Steinemann, Allah Shalom, asked for a blessing. He asked him, you keep Shabbat? He said, no. He said, I can't bless you. Why? It's not going to help. You're cursing yourself. So that's why Rabotai, HaKadosh Baruch Hu can do anything. Somebody asked me today, I have all these problems. Are you really sure that it could all be fixed? I said 100 million percent. She goes, yeah, but it will require a miracle. I said, for you it's a miracle. For Hashem it's natural. It's easy. You just have to do something about it. For you it's a miracle. For you it's difficult. For Hashem, like that. If he can make a kid that's mentally not there, become a normal kid in an hour, in a minute, in a second, 
because his parents decided to take on a mitzvah they didn't even realize is connected. What do you think? He can't solve your money crisis? He can't solve your loneliness? He can't solve your craziness? He can't solve your uh, lack of this and lack of that? He can solve everything. He can do everything. You just have to believe in yourself that you can do it. Everyone can do tshuva. And I'll tell you a story and then you can ask the next question. Rabbi Faim, Shekhe, gave a story today in a shiul. He says, the one time there was a guy selling balloons in the streets. And every so often to get the attention of the crowd, he would let, he would cut one of the balloons and let it fly in the air. You know, so people see, oh, something flies, so naturally people look. Oh, oh, and they want to buy the balloon. Ah, but buy me a balloon, buy me a balloon. So one little kid comes to the balloon salesman and he says, what about all, all these balloons, they can fly? He goes, yeah, all of them can fly. Well, what about that one black balloon? He goes, yeah, it can fly too. He goes, yeah, but it's black. It's ugly. It's, it's, just, it's, it's, not, it's, it's just not like the other one's colorful and they have all these things on it. It's just a regular balloon. He goes, they can fly. He goes, yeah, but it's like smaller. He goes, they can fly. He goes, yeah, but it's like to the side. It's not even like everyone else. He goes, it can fly. He goes, I don't know. Are you sure it can fly? Are you sure? He goes, son, it could fly. It doesn't matter what the balloon looks like and what its background is and where it was born and what neighborhood it grew up and if it converted and if it did tshuva and if it was frum and if it was a murderer and if it was a... It doesn't make a difference. What matters is what's inside. Son, there's helium inside. That helium will make that balloon fly. All I got to do is cut the cord. Let it loose and it'll fly. That's what we all have to do, Rabotai. Some of us a little more colorful than others. Some of us come from a much a black past. We are murderers and killers and all types of things that we didn't even know there's anything wrong. Akadosh Baruch Hu says it doesn't make a difference. What matters is that you have a neshama. You're alive, you can do tshuva. All you got to do is cut yourself loose from all of the past. Let it go. Go to Hashem. Stop feeling sorry for yourself that you didn't grow up a certain way or you didn't you had all these problems and you had this and you had that and all the excuses that Satan puts in your head of why you can't do chuba. You can do it. It doesn't matter what you look like and what you did in the past. What matters is what's inside. And what's inside is you have an ashama. It still works, you can do chuba. If you're watching the shiu, that means you can do chuba. If you couldn't do tshuva, I promise you, you wouldn't be watching the shul. Next question. Rav Kanyeski uh, didn't want to give the Michalel Shabbat the uh, bracha. Uh, how is maybe, um, a, 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 how should a, per, a, a person treat a Michalel Shabbat? How should a person treat a Michalel Shabbat? The Rambam writes in the Chod Shuvah that when you see somebody that's sinning, that's violating Shabbat, violating uh, different things, there's a certain treatment that you have to have towards him. First and foremost, you need to know that if he's a Mechalel Shabbat, you're not allowed to have him hold wine. If you're inviting him to uh, Kiddush and you have uh, expensive wine that's Lome uh, Vushah, that's uncooked, you're not allowed to have him pour the wine. Because according to Alakha in uh, the Rambam, uh, Ilchot Shabbat, chapter 30, 15th Alakha, which is the last Alakha, it says that a Mechalel Shabbat and an idol worshiper in the eyes of Hashem are considered exactly the same. By denying Hashem, by violating Shabbat, he's considered an idol worshiper. So that idol worshippers, like Christians for example, if they touch your wine and your wine is open, you're not allowed to drink that wine again. Why? Because maybe they sh- shook it for the sake of Avodah Zarah. Same thing is if a Mechalel Shabbat says Kaddish, you're not allowed to say Amen to his Kaddish. If somebody else says, that's a Shomer Shabbat, he says Kaddish, at the same time the Mechalel Shabbat says Kaddish, you could say Amen. Why? Because what you're saying in your mind, Amen to is the righteous person to keep Shabbat. You're saying Amen to him, not to the Mechalel Shabbat. You're also not allowed to give the Mechalel Shabbat an Aliyah to the Torah as part of the seven on Shabbat or part of the three during the uh, week. 
you can give him a mosif if you want to give him the 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, because those are not really the halacha. But if a mechalel Shabbat goes up to the bima and says the bracha as one of the seven on Shabbat or on, on the Chag, you're not allowed to say Amen because bracha levatalak. Why? Because in a din shamayim, he's considered an idol worshiper. So there's a certain treatment that you have to have on a mechalel Shabbat. If you want to get ma- married or there's some type of Jewish ceremony or a Jewish court, you cannot use a mechalel Shabbat as a witness. So you need to know all of these laws of how to treat a mechalel Shabbat. But, a very big but, the Rambam writes, you should not insult them publicly, you should not uh, abuse them, you have no right to insult them, you have no right to yell at them, you have no right to hit them, you have no right to hurt them in any way, shape, or form. The opposite. You are obligated to be a mekarev. Get him to become a Shomer Shabbat. By showing him some love, by showing him that Judaism is beautiful, by telling him the truth, and not... uh, you know, uh, sh- you know, beating around the bush and pretending like he's okay and everything's okay and Hashem loves him anyway, even though he's a Mechal Shabbat. No, tell him the truth in a nice way. Tell him, listen, Hashem loves you, but you're in trouble. Your father loves you, but you're in trouble. Your father loves you, but you're in trouble. Why? He didn't come home three days. He told you to come home at 8 o'clock. He didn't come home for three weeks. So he loves you, but you're in trouble. What is it like? HaKadosh Baruch Hu does not want to lose his children. But the problem is that sometimes his children don't even know that they're lost. And the sad thing is for HaKadosh Baruch Hu sometimes to see that his kids don't even know the difference between right, right and wrong. And it's like a... There was one time a king that had a son that went off the derech. Stopped keeping mitzvot, stopped keeping Torah, nothing, went away. The king was a tzaddik. Says, you don't want to keep Torah mitzvot? You don't want to act like a king? I don't want to hear from you. I don't want to hear from you. That's what sometimes religious people do with their kids. They go off the derech. Excuse me, they go off the derech. Tell them you go off the derech. You don't want to keep Shabbat? Don't even call me anymore. You're uh bend. You're on cherem. This is not the way to do it though. Unless that person causes other people to sin, that's not the right way to do it. You're not supposed to put your kids on cherem. Unless he causes other kids and influences other kids and your whole family's in danger. If he just chooses or she just chooses to be off the derech, but she still respects the religion, she's still a respectable person. When she comes to your house, she acts like a respectable person. She honors you, she honors the Shabbat, at least when she comes to your house or he comes to your house, there's no problem. But if this person is a, you know, menuval, disrespectful person, you know, uh, desecrate Shabbat in public, shows uh, up to the uh, shul with the car, beeps in front of the shul to show everybody that he's a homosexual or something. That's a person you put on cherem. That's a person that's like a shah. You run, run away from a person like this. But a regular kid usually doesn't do that unless something happened. But now, this king, his kid went off the derech, he overreacted, says, you don't want to keep Torah, you don't give me Torah, get out of here. I don't want to hear from you. But the king in his heart, he loves this kid. So what did he do? Every so often he checked on him. He sent somebody to go check on him, to spy on the kid. He asked him, how is he doing? He goes, ah, he's struggling, poor kid. He doesn't have money to eat, he hasn't eaten two days. King says, ah, Baruch Hashem. Baruch Hashem. No, I said he didn't have money to eat. He says, ah, Baruch Hashem. Okay. A week later he checks, so how's my kid? He goes, oh, you know, he's, he's struggling, he's uh, lonely, he's scared, he was crying. Ah, Baruch Hashem. No, I say he doesn't feel good. Ah, Baruch Hashem. Another few weeks pass. Because how's my kids doing? Ah, I think he has a cold. Ah, Baruch Hashem. No, cold. It's not good cold. It's not like cold. Baruch Hashem. Every time he tells him something bad with the kid, the king says, Baruch Hashem. It's like, wait, you hate this kid? He scanned the kid already. One day, good news. He goes, oh, your highness have good news. What? The kid found a few friends. And they took him in. He has a house now. He got a job. He's good. He's happy. The king starts crying. Ooh, he's crying. Wow, he worked crying. The king starts crying. The servant says, "I'm sorry, your highness. Um, please explain your th- explain yourself to me. I don't understand. You love your kid or you hate your kid?" He says, "Nobody loves my kid like I love my kid." He goes, "But I don't understand you." 
When I told you he has a cold and he's losing money and he's lonely and he's depressed and he's this and he's that, you kept saying, Baruch Hashem, and you were laughing and you were happy. Now I tell you, finally, you know, good things happening. He found some new friends. He has a job. He has food. Everything is good. You're crying. I don't understand you. He says, you don't understand me because you don't understand how much I love my son. He says, when my son was struggling and he didn't have food and he was sick and he was struggling, I had hope that eventually he was going to realize it's not good to be without Abba. Let me go back to Abba. Because when I was with Abba, I was healthy. I had money. I had food. Abba took care of me. So every time he told me good, bad things are happening, I said, ah, Baruch Hashem, there's still hope he's going to come back to me. And he's going to realize that it's not good to be without Abba. But now that you're telling me that he found new friends and he's happy in a different direction, I'm afraid that maybe I lost my son. Maybe he's not going to want to come back to Abba. This Rabbutai Karim is a Kadosh Baruch Hu with every single one of us every day. He does not hate the Mechalel Shabbat while he's still alive. He keeps him alive because he loves him and hopes that he comes back to him. So he gives him problems and he makes him lose money and he makes him have marriage problems and it makes her have a growth in our side and she doesn't know what it is. And the doctor leave a message that she uh, makes her scared and her friends not want to talk to her and her mom uh, doesn't uh, this. And all the problems that happen to the people's life, it's because a Kadosh Baruch Hu loves them and He gives them problem because maybe they'll realize it's not good to live without Abba. Avinu Sheba Shamayim. But once a person decides, no, I want to live without Abba. I'm going to go permanently off. I'm going to go against Abba publicly. I'm going to publicize that I'm against Abba. Hashem cries. Why? Because maybe he lost his son or daughter forever. So when you see someone that's a Mechalel Shabbat, or someone that's not keeping Torah and Mitzvot, as long as they're still re respectable people, as long as they are not people that make fun of the religion, make fun of the rabbis, but they're respectable, they just don't know, or they don't agree because they don't know, and they're simply ignorant, your job is to be a Mechalev. Bring them close and make them realize Life without Abba, life without Hashem, is not a life. It's Genom. Get them to watch a shiul that we do here. Get them to watch today's shiul. And they'll realize that life without Abba is not a life. But if the person makes fun of Hashem, makes fun of the Torah, makes fun of Tamidei Chachamim, that person you run away from. Why? He's a danger not only to himself, He's a danger to society. So it all depends who this person is. How they treat the Torah. If he's a missionary, Allah, according to the Rambam and Shukhan Aruch, you're not allowed to be within four amot. You're not allowed to stand six feet of him. If he's a missionary, he causes people to go against the Shem actively, not allowed to even sit, be six feet next to him. But if he's just ignorant, he drives on Shabbat because he figures he has a car, so he might as well drive. He eats not kosher because that's the only food he has. He steals in his job because he thinks, ah, I'm only stealing from uh, non-Jews. Because he thinks it's okay to steal from non-Jews. He doesn't realize it's even worse. He makes all these stupid decisions because that's the influence around him and he never heard the emet before. That person, you got to bring him closer. How do you bring him closer? You bring him to Torah. You send him a shiul, you bring him to a shiul and you show him the emet. You expose him to emet. Bringing him closer doesn't mean feeding them chulant until they get fat. Some people think, oh, I bring him closer, I, I bring him to shul, uh, right at Tzudash Lishit. Yeah, but what about the shul? No, you know, once they see how fun it is to be a Jew by eating so much chulant, maybe they'll want to become religious. No, they'll just want to become fat. Becoming fat doesn't make you religious. There's plenty of non-religious people that are fat. People think that if you just feed, feed, feed people, that makes them religious. Oh, I'm going to invite them to the Hanukkah party. What, what kind of shoe are you have in the Hanukkah party? No, there's no shoe, but we all eat sufganiyot and play with uh, the sevigon. Don't bring him. Why? He's going to think that's religion? He's going to think he's religious. He eats more sufganiyot than everybody, and he plays with the sevigon better than everybody. He's going to think he's a chassid, because he won the sevigon contest. 
bring him to the Shul Torah that tells the Emet. That's what bringing him closer means. And that's what Aaron Akoin did. Aaron Akoin will bring people to the Torah, not the Torah to people. You never lower the Torah for people. You never water down the Torah. The Lubavitcher Rebbe, Allah Shalom, Shalom, is a clip recently published. He says you're never allowed to water down the Torah in order to soothe people. You have to tell people the emet as it is, even if it's hard to take. Why? Because that's what Torah, you have no right to change the Torah and modernize it for people and water it down for people and soften it for people. You have no right, you have no permission. It doesn't matter who you are and for what cause. You tell people what the emet is as it is. If you're not comfortable talking about Gehenom, don't talk about Gehenom. Talk about Kafakela instead. No, I mean, talk about something else. Talk about Shabbat. Talk about other mitzvot. You don't have to talk about the, the, the tough stuff. But don't lie. Don't change the truth. Tell them the truth. Tell them that it's an obligation, not a favor. You're not doing Hashem a favor by keeping Shabbat. It's so your obligation to keep Shabbat or you're going to get punished. Your life is terrible because you're going against Hashem. What if the guy's religious? Apparently you're not religious enough. If you were religious enough, either you wouldn't have problems or you would understand why you have problems. Because you're religious that you know why you don't have problems and the problems are good for you. Which means that if you have problems you don't understand why, you're not religious enough. Next question. Covered. Next, give him the mic. Back to life because of we need to fix something that we did in our past life, right? Okay. okay. So my question is, if that's our purpose in life, why did Hashem in the first place create Adam and Chava, which I mean they didn't have a past life? Like, well, why? Why did He decide just to make you know a human race? And like Jewish people and this and that, like what was the purpose of that? What was the purpose of creation? So there's two answers to your question. Chazal says there's two answers. One, we really don't know. We really don't know. But the second answer is that we have a little bit of a taste that we learned from our sages that it's likely this, it is this, but that's not the whole reason. Meaning, what I'm going to tell you is the reason, but it's not the whole reason. Like, for example, your, uh, your parents are going to tell you, please come with me to uh, this place. And you're going to ask them, why do you want me to come with you? Oh, I want you to uh, see if maybe uh, you're going to you know, eat with me. I want you to eat with me. I want to go out to eat. I want you to come eat with me. He says, okay, I'm hungry. I'm going to go eat. In reality, yes, she wants you to eat with her. Your father wants you to eat with them. But also, they want you to meet somebody because maybe that's going to be a shiduch. They want you to spend time with them because they want to get closer to you. There's different reasons. So what I'm about to tell you is a reason, but it's not the whole reason. The whole reason we don't know because we're not Hashem. What's that reason? Hashem is the ultimate source of good. Everything that's any good in the world is Hashem. He's the ultimate good. Now the definition of good is not someone that is selfish it's someone that's generous it's not someone that's cheap it's someone that provides others it's not someone that is arrogant it's someone that's humble meaning that a person that's good or something that's good is something that produces good in order to be defined as good you have to produce good you can't just say I'm a good person I say, okay, so how many people did you help this week? No one. How many people did you help in your life? No one. Do you help anyone other than yourself? No. So what makes you good? Oh, I don't kill people. Well, that doesn't make you good. It just doesn't make you a murderer. You're not a murderer, but that not being a murderer does not make you good. The cow doesn't murder people. She's not going to heaven because she doesn't murder people. She's not good because she doesn't murder people. The monkey eats peanuts. He doesn't murder people. That does not make him does not make him a good monkey. Just makes him not a murderer. So not murdering and not stealing doesn't make you good. It makes you not a thief or not a murderer. Being good means that you are creating something good. So you are helping somebody else. 
Being good means you're giving yourself to somebody else. You're giving your time, your effort, your resources. You're giving of yourself to somebody else even when you don't have to. And not for a personal benefit because if you give somebody money in order for them to give you some goods uh, on a phone, you buying a phone doesn't make you good. It just makes you a customer. A customer is not good. He's just a customer. But if you give somebody money without asking anything for return, just because you want to help them, that's called tzedakah. That's good. That makes you good. For that moment at least. So Hashem is the ultimate good. But in order for Him to show His goodness, in order for Him to be good, He had to create good. Since He cannot give anything to Himself, since He has everything, He had to give that goodness to something else. Hence, He created the world. And He created people. Now, in order for people to know the difference between good and bad, He had to create good and bad. He had to create a world with Torah for Am Yisrael and a world without Torah for the people that are not part of Am Yisrael. He had to create people that are giving. He had to take, get people that are taking. One of the Kufrim asked Rabbi Akiva, how, if Hashem is so good and He loves Am Yisrael, how come He created poor people? Rabbi Akiva answers in the Gemara, in order to save the rest of us, from dinashel genom, from judgment of genom. Why? Since we make sins, and sometimes it's not enough time for us to fix those sins. Sometimes we don't even know how to fix them. So by creating the poor people, he's giving us an opportunity to give them part of us, the money that we worked for, the money that Hashem gave us. When we give the money, in order to publicize Torah, in order to eat food in order to uh, buy a sidur, buy a chumash, in order to do good things, that's saving us from our own sins because that mitzvah that they're doing is helping us fix our sins. So he created the poor people in order to save the rest of us from genom. So he gave us the ability to be good, to emulate him. So Shem created the world in order to do good because he's the ultimate good he created Adam and Chava as two people that are going to be the, the beginning of civilization initially it was supposed to be just them it was enough to just create the world just for them but since they failed and they were not satisfied with all the good that Hashem gave them they wanted more than what they had Hashem punished them by in essence having them be the beginning of creation and the rest of creation have the obligation to fix the original sin every time a woman gives birth she suffers it's very difficult to carry the baby to give birth to the baby and then to raise the baby all of that suffering is part of the tshuva for the original sin that Chava made by feeding the husband the forbidden fruit Every time a man works hard in a kosher job and he works hard and he works overtime and it's hard for him to make money and so on, that difficulty is part of the tshuva of the original sin of, of Adam Rishon. So in essence, that is a punishment, it's a curse, but it's also a tikkun. In order to achieve the ultimate good, which is everyone that chooses the right thing to do, will achieve the ultimate goodness and get the benefit of being with the ultimate good, which is to be with the Shekhinah, to be with Hashem. And everyone that chooses to stay with the curse will be cursed permanently until they are destroyed. The righteous will be with Hashem in Gan Eden and the wicked will be destroyed after suffering for their crimes. Only two options. There's no middle ground. So Hashem cannot make everybody go to heaven because then there's no point if everyone is going to get the same reward then there's no point of listening to Hashem so he has to make a reward system the ones that listen to Hashem and overcome the difficulty of the tests they get the ultimate reward of being with Hashem for eternity 
the ones that don't listen to Hashem but instead listen to the Satan and they continue sinning and don't do tshuva, they'll get punished forever for that little bit of joy that they have in this world. So, good has to have a reward system. Your parents, when they tell you, I'm going to give you a gift, you say thank you, right? But if instead of saying thank you, you curse them out, guess what? That gift is not a gift anymore. You're not getting nothing. You're getting bupkis. You're probably going to be uh, locked in your room until you're 50 years old. Why? Because you're uh, not listening to your parents and instead of saying thank you, you say the opposite. Same thing with Hashem. Hashem gives us gifts every day. We don't say thank you all the time. Eventually, He wants us to say thank you and do tshuva. Because sometimes we take money that Hashem gives us. Instead of buying a sidul, buying a chumash, buying, uh, doing mitzvot with it, what do we do? We go to clubs. We uh, buy uh, drugs. We do bad things with the money that Hashem gave us. That's not a thank you. That's misusing Hashem's money. So if a person stays that way and is ungrateful to Hashem, eventually he has to get punished for a very, very long time. But if a person makes a mistake, but eventually he says, I'm sorry, Hashem, everything I did was a mistake. From now on, I'm going to try my best not to make mistakes like this anymore. From now on, I'm going to say I'm sorry. I'm going to say thank you. I'm going to be polite. I'm going to be a good boy. I'm going to be a good girl. From now on, I'm going to listen to you. Hashem says, I love you. You now are my favorite. I'm going to treat you like you're the only son in the world. You're the only daughter in the world because you're listening to me. And I'm going to reward you for eternity. And that's, that's, that's the reward system. That's in essence a must for all of creation. Everyone knows that if you work hard for certain companies, you're more likely to succeed. If you work hard in your marriage, your marriage will succeed. If you work hard in anything in life, the reward is much more likely and most likely definite. With Hashem, it's always definite if you work hard. But the same token, if you don't work hard, the punishment is definite. One of the examples we see that it doesn't matter where you come from and how smart you are is that there is in a Nevi'im, there is a judge that we have in uh, Sefer Shoftim, a woman by the name of Dvorah. Dvorah was one of the Shoftim. She was a prophet that was also a Shofet, a judge for Am Yisrael. A lot of miracles went through her. She spoke to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, this, this tzaddikah. But when it mentions her in the Torah, it says, Dvorah eshet lapidot. Dvorah, the wife of lapidot. Dvorah was a judge, was a prophet. Instead of being recognized as Dvorah, the wife, uh, the, the, uh, the tzaddikah, Dvorah the prophet, Dvorah the righteous, Dvorah, what do they remember? Dvorah the eshet lapidot. What is eshet lapidot? What's lapidot? Lapidot is the p'til in a uh, in uh, Bet HaMikdash, you had the menorah, and you had the p'til. What's the p'til? In, uh, the wick. You had the wick, and the lapidot was the wick on the menorah that uh, she was, in essence, a contributor to this menorah to make the special wick. What is this like? It's like you have the uh, your wife. She helped you your whole life become a success, become this, become that. And you say, oh, Rabotai is my, my wife that helped me build this, you know, billion-dollar company, this and that. But instead of saying that, we say, here's my wife, Rabotai, she makes the best omelet. You have like the biggest tzaddikai in the world. You have the biggest tzaddikai in the world. Ah, Rabotai, here is uh, my wife. She, uh, she uh, makes a uh, good gefilte fish. Here's my wife. She has a blue dress. Nicest blue dress. Watch it. Say, Dvora, the, uh, the Kedosha, Dvora, the uh, Tzadika, Dvora, the Prophet. What Eshet Lapidot? The Gemara in Masechet Megillah says, what's Eshet Lapidot? Eshet Lapidot was because Dvora was married to her husband. His name was Lapidot. He had three names. Barak, Lapidot, and Michael. Why was he named Lip- uh, uh, um Lapidot says because her husband was a Am Aretz. His brain was like a uh, gefilte fish. He wasn't the, the smartest guy in the world. He, he couldn't learn Torah. Aleph Bet didn't know, nothing. But Dvorah was tzedika. She knew, listen, Hashem didn't obligate you to become a Talmud Chacham if you can't. If you don't know how to read and write, He's not going to expect you to be Chatam Sofer. 
write books. You don't know how to read and write. He's not going to expect you to be Moshe Rabbeinu without being a prophet. What does he expect you, Hashem? To be the best you can be. So my dear husband, you can go to the Bet HaMikdash and make the wicks of the menorah the best you possibly can be. That's what you can do. Our husband wasn't smart, but he listened to his wife. He said, okay, that's what I can do. I'm going to go to Bet HaMikdash. I'm going to make the best wicks. And he made the best wicks. Not like a little wick like you buy from the uh, kosher market. It's a half, a, it's nothing. It goes, it, it, you know, go, it gets destroyed by nothing. He made Mama Slapidot. It was like something like it was uh, something respectable. It was like a fire came out of it. Because he put all of his effort into making these wicks over and over again, he got to the level of Ruach HaKodesh. He got to the level of Ruach HaKodesh. Why? He did the best he could do with the tools that he had. Why? Because of his wife. His wife says, be the best you can be. What you have, be the best with the tools you have. You have an IQ of 150, you have to be Tamih Chacham. You have an IQ of 5, be whatever you can be with that. Whatever you can do, whatever tools you have, you're good with your hands, do something good with your hands, that's to sanctify Shem's name. You have good uh, eyes, do something with your eyes. You have good this, whatever you have, whatever tools Hashem gave you, do something with those tools to sanctify Shem's name. That's all Hashem expects from you. That's why Rabotai, enough of feeling bad for ourselves of who we were and what we were, what do you have, do the best you can with it. Why? Because if you do the best you can with it, Eliyahu Navi, Eliyahu Navi testifies in Tana Deve Eliyahu, um, chapter 10, in Eliyahu Rabbah, he says, I testify that no matter if it's a man or a woman, a slave or a master, a goy or a Jew, a child or an adult, Eliyahu Navi says, I testify, everything is based on the actions, and if you do the actions that Hashem says, the Shekhinah will come down upon you. Meaning every single person here, every single person watching can reach the level of Ruach HaKodesh if they do the will of Hashem. Perfect though. No uh, 50-50, no only on Thursdays and Fridays. Perfect. You get the level of Ruach HaKodesh if you use the tools that Hashem gave you. And it's not me saying it, it's Eliyahu Navi saying it. You have a problem, call him, maybe he'll come visit you. But that's the key, Rabotai. Everyone here can do tshuva. Everyone here can become the biggest tzaddik that they know. And that's the key. But you have to try. You have to try and try harder and harder and harder and take it seriously. Because that's the most important part. Next question. Does it have to be difficult for a boy to become a Jew? Is it necessarily... Uh, is, is that like a necessary part of it? And also in the past, for example, Onkelos, what was his uh, uh, test to become Jewish? Like, what, what did he have to do? Is it the same? What, it seems today... It's harder than Onkelos. It seems today many people, many people uh, uh, become Jewish to please uh, the partner in a marriage. Right. And uh, then the marriage breaks up because uh, it wasn't really for that, you know. And, and I'm really surprised that 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 the Betin actually accepted the year. And, 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 and then the wife or the husband goes back to the way they were, and everything, you know, family gets destroyed. Arab so Moshe what's going on with that? Shalom says that people that convert for marriage are not real converts; they're fake converts. They're not considered Jewish. A person that uh, converts for marriage only and not converting because of the will of Hashem is not to be considered Jewish. Now, if they already were with somebody, that uh, one was Jewish, one was not Jewish, and they wanted to they stay together, but they ended up converting because of Hashem, not because of the marriage, but they benefited as a result of conversion, they ended up kosherizing their marriage. That's not a problem. But if they only converted for the sake of marriage, it's not a conversion at all. It's completely fake. doesn't matter what the Bedin says. The Bedin was fooled, unfortunately, 
and not uh, Bedins do not have Ruach Kodesh. They don't have uh, prophecy. They don't know what, why everybody is converting. You could fool a Bedin. They're just people. They're Chachamim, but they're people. They're flesh and blood. So they don't know who's lying, who's not lying. But someone that converts for the wrong reason, they're in Shemaim, they're not considered Jewish. They dip into the mikveh Miriam. Uh, they can dip, dip into the mikveh Maria. They stay Maria. They dip into the mikveh Jose. They stay Jose. But if they dip for the right reason, she dips into the into the uh, into the mikveh Maria. She comes out Sarah. He dips into the mikveh Jose. He comes out Yaakov. Tzadik. Why? The right reason. What's in their heart? Who knows what's in their heart? They could fool the Dayanim. They could fool their husband, their wife, the community. They could fool everybody. They cannot fool Hashem. And they'll get punished for it. Now, people that do that, there's no one stupider than them in the world. There's no one stupider than them in the world. Why? Because it was better off for them not to do anything. Because now they're just increasing the sin even worse. Because now they're making other people think that they're Jewish. To treat them as Jewish. And potentially they could have kids. And they're going to have kids that are going to marry other kids. And their kids most likely going to have very difficult lives and most likely going to even die. Young. Why? Because the Kadosh Baruch Hu has to destroy that seed. Sometimes you see people die young. That's the reason. Why? A Kadosh Baruch Hu sometimes has to destroy people in order not to allow their seed to continue in the world. It's not always the reason, but it, it is a reason. Just like a Kadosh Baruch Hu says he's not going to allow the seed of a mamzer continue in the world. But sometimes mamzerim uh, are, are alive. Someone that had a child with a woman that was married which to somebody else, that child is a mamzer. Now, if the husband of that woman doesn't know and she continues pretending like he is their son, guess what? At some point or another, Hashem is going to have to either kill that kid or his kids or not allow him to reproduce because he does not want that the seed of that mamzer to continue in the world. I met somebody who did not know he's a mamzer until he was almost 40, 50 years old. 40, 50 years old, didn't know that he was a mamzer. He only found out from his mom on her deathbed that she, uh, that she uh, did something that was not uh, allowed. And he was a mamzer. Six months later, his son died and his kid. His son and grandson died in the same day. Six months later, his son and his, his grandson died in the same day. How? Car exploded for no reason. They go, they want to go to the park, turn on the car, boom. Not mafia, not gangsters, nothing. Just exploded. Something went wrong with the gas tank. Wrong. Kadosh Baruch Hu. Exploded the car. Both of them died. His continuation, his seed died. I saw this with my own eyes. Sometimes Hashem does things like this. So, as far as conversion, if it's the right conversion, it is difficult. Why is it difficult? First and foremost, it's important to know if the person is real. If the person is really converting for the right reason, it doesn't matter how difficult it is, they're going to stay strong. Why? Because a convert, if they know that this is the way they're going to live for the rest of their life, it doesn't matter how long it's going to take to convert, it doesn't matter how difficult it is, because they know that this is what they're going to do for the rest of their life anyway. They're going to keep Torah and Mitzvot anyway. They're going to learn Torah and Mitzvot anyway. They're going to do everything that they're doing now for the conversion forever anyway. So what difference does it make if I convert today or I convert in a year from now? It doesn't make a difference. So anyone that complains about how difficult a conversion is usually doesn't end up converting. Or if they convert, they're usually one of these problematic converts. There's a lot of problematic converts. But people that are real righteous converts, they suffer. But they don't complain. They continue plugging away and they continue going until they convert for the right reason. Bezal Hashem, Hashem gives them the Siat Bishmaya. I've seen it with my own eyes. People that are fake converts and people that are real converts. And you see that the fake converts, they're a disaster and they always are looking for a shortcut and they always find some fool to convert them. And they fool everybody else, but you see shortly after they go back to their wicked ways and they're just a disaster. The righteous converts, you see that their lives are very different. From the beginning, you see these people going the right path. And Baruch Hashem, their lives are blessed. They may have difficulties, but they know that there's Avinu Sheba Shamaim. There's our Father in Heaven that helps them along the way. Now, 
So the first thing is the Betty needs to make sure, and the rabbi that's sponsoring people needs to make sure that the person is genuine. If the person is looking for a handout or for quickly to convert, you cannot verify if this person is legitimate. Second thing is, in order to convert, you need a few things. You need to know how to be a Jew. You cannot convert as a secular Jew. You can't convert and say, listen, I want to convert, but I don't want to keep Shabbat. Then you don't want to be a Jew. If you convert, you have to be Haredi. You have to be the most religious person you know. That's how it converts. Why? Because last week you drove on Shabbat as a Goy, it's not a problem. But as a Jew, you drive on Shabbat, it's death penalty. So why would you convert and bring a death penalty to your life? Just don't convert. You're allowed to drive on Shabbat as a Goy. Why bring it to your life to, 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 to be a Jew and to drive on Shabbat? Meaning, if you're going to convert, you have to be Haredi. You have to be the most religious person you know. People that convert and fool people, fool the Bedin, fool the husband, fool the wife, and don't plan on keeping Shabbat, don't plan on keeping mitzvot, these people are fake, they're not converts, and all of their kids are goyim. And even if they, if they started as righteous, they had good intentions initially, but then they fell off the der, they're still Jews, but they're stupid. Why? It was better off they stayed goyim. Because at least they wouldn't have been punished. Now they're going to be punished. Now they're going to go to Geno if they don't do Chuba. So, it's important for people to know what they're doing. It takes time to know what you're doing. A few months to learn the basics at least. And at least a year to go through the holidays. To know, do you even want to be part of the nation? Second thing is, you need to live in a Jewish community. You cannot be a new Jew in the middle of Montana by yourself and your next door neighbor is a horse. You have to live in a Jewish community to know that there is a tefillah, when to go to pray, when there's holiday, how to shake your lulav, how to build a sukkah, what to do. You need to live in a Jewish community. You can't be a Jew by yourself just because you're reading uh, books. You have to be part of a community. Now, a Jewish community is difficult? Yes, that's part of being Jewish. You don't like difficulty? Don't be Jewish. Jews are experts in difficulty. That's what we're experts in. We're the best in difficulty in the world. What kind of difficulty? Difficulty we give each other. Difficulty we give ourselves. Difficulty we give to Hashem. Difficulty. We like problems. Why? That's what we are. Am Kshe'orif. Stubborn nation. We don't like each other for no reason. You look at a guy, his nose is not that uh, big to you, not that small to you, not that straight to you. You don't like him for no reason. He's Ashkenazi, you don't like him. He's Faradi, you don't like him. He's Yemenite, you don't like him. He's black, you don't like him. Why? No reason. Sinat Chinam. If you love everybody, you should question. Maybe you're not Jewish. If you love everybody, there's something wrong with you. I'm not really sure. Maybe convert, right? Oh, convert. Oh, yeah, that's why you love everybody. You're a convert. Why? Because we have Am Kshe'orev. We have, uh, we're with stubborn people. Now, of course, you're supposed to love everybody. It's an obligation to love everybody. But it's tough to love everybody. Why? Because you love yourself too much. So these are some of the difficulties that converts deal with. It's a, it's a life adjustment. A lot of converts are idealistic. They think that they're going to come, they're going to convert, they're going to join the nation, and it's going to be like Mount Sinai. It's, there's no Mount Sinai. <laughs> there's no Mount Sinai. You're not coming into Mount Sinai. Forget that. That's Olam Abba you're talking about. Here, it's difficult. You go to a community, sometimes they're not going to like you. Why? Because they don't like you. They won't accept you. Maybe because you're a convert. Maybe because you're a different color. Maybe because you're too tall. You're too short. You're too rich. You're too poor. They just don't want to like you for different reasons. You have to understand this comes with it. If your conversion is based on the Jews, don't convert. Again, if you're converting for Jewish people to like you, do not convert. The only reason to convert is to serve Akadosh Baruch Hu the best you possibly can as a human being. That's the only reason to convert. Whether the Jewish people like you or not is irrelevant. Whether the Jewish people are perfect or not is irrelevant. You have to be perfect. The obligation is on you. They also have an obligation, but just because everyone else is failing on the test, doesn't mean that you're allowed to fail also. So, if you're converting for people, don't convert. Do us a favor. We have enough problems already. So, a lot of people are idealistic, and they come in, they think that they're going to convert, they're going to move to Eretz Yisrael, and over there, there's no problems, there's no lefty liberals and homosexuals. That, what are you talking about? There's more over there sometimes than here. 
You go to Tel Aviv, Hashem Echem, it's Sodom and Gomorrah, it's calling from Gainom, says this is worse. So it's not perfect, but there are holy people in Am Yisrael. You go to different places, different Jewish communities, you're always going to find tzaddikim. You're always going to find special people. In every Jewish community, you're always going to find a few special people. Connect to them. Look for them. Don't look to become friends with everybody. There's one person, a thousand people in the community. One tzaddik, connect to the one tzaddik. Oh, but he's too busy. Okay, so he's too busy. He's too busy, he's too busy. So the key is to understand, conversion is not supposed to be easy. Why not? Because Am Yisrael has been fighting and sacrificing their life for 3,300 years just to maintain being Am Yisrael. What do you think? Just because you read a few books, you're going to join us without suffering? We've been suffering for 3,000 years. The least you can do is suffer for a few years. We're experts at suffering. What do you think? You're going you're to read a few books and you're going to just join? No, you have to suffer a little bit. Why? Because that's part of being a Jew. Now guess what? If you know the truth, you know that the Torah is the truth. And you can convert. You can convert. But you choose not to. Because you're not ready yet. You're 18 years old. You figure I'm going to do when I'm 25. I'm going to do when I'm 30. I'm going to do it later on. Gemara says Hashem will punish you for it. Wait a minute, but I converted. I didn't have to convert. No, you didn't have to. But now that you converted, Hashem is going to punish you. Why? Why did you delay? Why'd you delay your conversion? You knew that you're supposed to serve me with 613 mitzvot? How come you delayed? No, no, I, I, I didn't know. Oh, you should have known. Now, if the delay is not your fault, that's not your problem. But if the delay is your fault, you'll get punished for it. Even if you convert and you're righteous. That's why sometimes converts, they start off their life with a very, very difficult life. It's part of the punishment for delaying. Now, there's not a single convert in the world that went through the same test as Onkelos. I have one student in Eretz Israel. When he told his father he wants to convert, his father tried to kill him. He shot him. He missed. Shot him with shotgun. Shot him with shotgun. He missed, Baruch Hashem. The kid ran away. Baruch Hashem arrived at Eretz Israel. I was with him the whole way, giving him some guidance, my skin, going from place to place. Baruch Hashem arrived in Eretz Yisrael after a couple years, two, three years. Baruch Hashem converted in Bnei Brak. Tzaddik learns Torah. Now, he had surprise. Why? His father tried to kill him, Amash. Onkelos didn't happen to him once. Multiple times. Why? Because Onkelos was the next in line to be the Caesar. He was royalty. He was the next in line to be the Caesar. But he says, no, no, I want to be part of the slaves. What part of the slaves? What are you talking about? I want to be part of Am Yisrael. What are you talking about? We're killing Jews in the streets just for being Jewish. Yeah, I want to be part of them. The Caesar sent people to his house, says, go bring him here. We'll bring him, to the, to, bring him over here. They brought some people to his house. He told them a few things. They all converted too. See, he sent some more people to his house. Said, but don't let him talk to you. Don't let him talk to you. They went to his house. He started talking. He said, no, you're not talking. We're going to kill you. Okay, no problem. No problem. Okay, just come with us. On the way out, he kissed the mezuzah. They asked him, why did you kiss the mezuzah? What is that? He says, no, see, your king, your king, you have to protect him. Why? He's scared. He's sitting inside a castle. And the only thing he can do is protect you maybe over there. But in reality, you need to protect him. He says, my king, my king, he's everywhere. I just have to kiss the mezuzah to remind myself I love my king. I love his mitzvot because my king protects me everywhere. He's not like your king, right? I need to protect him. I'm, my king protects me. They converted also. He kept sending people. Every person he sent them converted and eventually they let him go. Meaning that Onkelos put his life on the line day in, day out. He knew that if he converts, they're going to kill him with cold blood. He didn't know that Hashem is going to save him, make miracles or anything like that. 
like Avraham Avinu jumped into the fire, he didn't know that Hashem is going to take him out of the fire. So, the tzaddikim, they don't know that Hashem is going to save them. But they still do it, and that's what makes them tzaddikim. So, Onkelos sacrificed his life day in, day out, and gave up royalty for the sake of being part of the slaves. Just because Torah is in it. No one in the world, Baruch Hashem, needs to go through that type of test. But needless to say, people go through their own tests. So is conversion difficult? Yes. Can it be easier? Yes. Are you going to benefit? Are you going to be the one that's going to be easier for or not? It all depends. Some people have an easy conversion. Some people have a hard conversion. But I can tell you for sure, I've never met a single person, convert or natural born Jew, that has an easy life. No one has an easy life. I had one person that had an easy conversion, very hard life. Another person had a very hard conversion, very easy life since. Some mix a little hard here, hard there, easy here, easy there. Different people have different tests. But the point is, is that don't look for conversion to be easy. It's not part of the equation. Yes? So funny, Jew, Jews are stubborn. If you don't like difficulties, don't be Jewish. Okay. So much enjoyed your answer. The person asked the question for okay. enjoyed your answer so much. That's the truth. Don't, it's, it's, you know, some, people, some people are idealistic. They think that uh, they're going to solve all of their problems because they're going to become Jewish or because they do tshuva. Torah does not solve all of your problems magically. It gives you a reason for them. When you learn Torah... You understand why you have problems. Who's the one that's giving you problems? It's Hashem. Hashem is the one that's giving you the problems for a reason. So, don't live in some La La Land world thinking that if you read this, uh, you know, book, it's everything's going to be fixed magically. Yes, there are certain zgulot that bring certain blessings and open certain doors in heaven for different people, but... Don't be like one of these cuckoos that thinks that if you do this one thing, all problems will be solved. You'll never be hungry. You'll never be poor. You'll never be uh, sad. You'll never go need to go to the bathroom again. You're never going to do that. Don't, don't live in such a la la land. Life is life. If you don't have problems, that's probably because you're dead and you're on the way to Olam Abba and then you'll have to deal with whatever you did. Here, it's a life of problems. The Torah is an instruction manual of how to deal with them without losing your mind. Without the Torah, you're simply going to lose your mind and live a very depressing, miserable, purposeless life. That's what the life is without Torah. What's the point of you being alive? Give me one good reason to be alive without Torah. No, everyone can volunteer, even if you're religious. Give me one good reason to be alive without Torah. One good reason, not five. I'm not going to make it difficult for you guys. Give me one good reason of why it's a point, Bechlal, to be alive without living for Torah. Give me a reason. No. Pleasure. Pleasure for what? The, 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 uh, the, the pleasure that people have, physical pleasure, it ends very quickly. And the more pleasure you have, the more numb you become to pleasure, which means that even the amount of pleasure you can get ends. So, okay, so let's say you've got all the pleasure you possibly can in whatever, sexually, or food, or uh, money, whatever it is, eventually you become numb to it, and there, after that, you cannot pleasure. You eat too much, you get diabetes, you can't eat anymore. You know, you, uh, you, uh, you're too uh, pr promiscuous, you get diseases, you die. You, uh, you know, uh, money, too much money, you're numb to money, you pretty much care less about money. All of the pleasures of the world, you can't have too much of them. And if you do, you start vomiting. Dvash matzata echol dayeka. Pentis be'ena be'ekiyato. Shlomo HaMelech says, you found honey, eat a little bit. Why? You eat too much, you're going to vomit. Even honey, as sweet, as delicious as it is, you eat too much, you're going to hate it. Yes? A good, a good reason to be happy... <laughs> to be alive. A good reason to is to be world. happy with yourself, be a good person for yourself, and be in peace. Okay, so a good reason to live in the world without Torah is to be happy and to be a good person. Problem is, define happy. What's happy? 
happy is having the physical pleasures of the world. We just uh, we just uh, declared already that the physical pleasures of the world are limited, and most of the time they lead to bad. Too much sexual pleasure, you become numb. What ends up happening with people that are too promiscuous? They become numb. They want something taboo. They don't want a you know they don't want the opposite sex anymore. They want the same sex. That's what Rabbi Nachman in Breslov says in Lekutei Maran. Homosexuality is a result of promiscuity. Promiscuity is a result of being promiscuous with yourself. Now, after a person becomes homosexual, if that's not enough, he becomes one of these disgusting people that go into marches and things like that. Eventually, that's not enough. So what happens? He starts doing with animals. That's why in America, in America, civilized country, in America, over 3 million people admit to being with animals on a regular basis. Almost 1% of the American public admits to being with animals, performing bestiality. Why? They have experienced all of the pleasures of sexuality to the point that they're numb to normal sexuality. Money. The U.S. government did a study about suicide and discovered an amazing conclusion. Suicide is a rich person's problem. Over 71% of suicides happen to rich people. Poor people do not commit suicide anywhere near as much as rich people. You would think the opposite. You would think the guy has nothing to live for. He has no money. He's homeless. He kills himself. No, he's going to live till 90. The rich guy that has $150 million in a bank, he's going to kill himself. Why? He didn't get the part in the movie. Someone wrote an article about him insulting him in the Wall Street Journal. He lost a little bit of money in the market. Rich, uh, a guy worth $9 billion, German guy, was on Forbes 500, worth $9 billion. 2008 market crashed. He lost $8 billion. Meaning, he wasn't poor. He still had $1 billion left. Guess what? He ran in front of a train, killed himself. Why? He couldn't live with himself. Can't take it. I only have a billion dollars. Shem yilachem alenu. What stupid people do. Why? Because of money, you become numb. Food, you eat too much, you become sick. Meaning all of the physical pleasures of the world is how we define happiness. But it's wrong. Why? Because if you have too much of it, you have too much of it, it's not good for you. Which means happiness is not something you could attain physically. Happiness is a spiritual feeling. Happiness is attaining something spiritual. The problem is you cannot attain the ultimate spirituality and be living a lie at the same time. The ultimate source of goodness, of spirituality, comes from the Torah. Meaning you cannot attain happiness without the Torah. Because that's the ultimate spirituality. You're going to try to attain happiness through money? People are committing suicide. Food? People are dying. Uh, sex? People are becoming crazy in the streets. Somebody told, called me today. Somebody called me today. Religious family. Religious family. Said we went to the best schools, best yeshiva, best bet yaakov, best everything. We don't know what happened. Our 30-year-old kid wants to be, uh, he's a guy, wants to be a girl. What? What do you mean he wants to be a girl? He's a guy. Yeah, but he wants to be a girl now. Why he wants to be a girl? He doesn't want to be, a, he can't live with himself. Did he get raped? Did he get molested? No, nothing. Something must have happened. We don't know. Why? Because people are connecting happiness to physicality. We don't even know what happiness is. So to be happy cannot be attained physically. It's only spiritually. And the ultimate source of spirituality is the Torah. Now what about good? He said to be good too. Be good. Define good. What's good? Good is to do good. How can you be good if you're ungrateful to the Creator that gave you good? To be a good person for yourself. Be a good person for yourself. That means you're selfish. Be By, right. To be a good person for yourself, that means you're selfish. By definition, selfish is the opposite of good. Being good means you're creating good. Create good means that, number one, you're creating gratitude. You're grateful to anyone that does good for you. Somebody opens a door for you, what do you say? Thank you. 
So if you say, why would you open the door? Hey, that makes you not a good person. Why? Because you're supposed to say thank you instead. Somebody gives you a meal. You throw the meal in their face. Ah, what do you cook this way, my monkey? Cook a nice meal. What does that make you a good husband? No, it makes you rotten potatoes. You're not a good person. Good creates good. Good creates good. How can you be good if all the good that Hashem gives you, you're not even saying thank you by following His Torah? He gave you the breath in your lungs. You're not even saying thank you. He gave you the um, you know, money. You're using it to go buy pornography. You're using it to go gamble. You're using it to go buy uh, things that are against Hashem. How could that be gratitude? How can you be good without being good to the one that's providing you good? Meaning, without following Torah, you cannot be good. Hitler, Imach Shimo Vezichro, was absolutely certain, and he wrote it in his Mein Kampf, that he's not only good, he's the ultimate good by solving the Jewish problem. Because he felt that the existence of Jews is a problem for all of mankind. Therefore, he would solve it by taking life away from them. Now, he woke up every day, just like you and me, certain he's good. Is he good or no? He's not good. Why? He's a mass murderer. Which means you cannot define good because you're not the one that determines what good is. The only one that could determine what good is is the one that created good. The one that created good is Hashem. And He told you exactly who is good, someone that keeps my Torah. Because if you keep my Torah, naturally, you're going to be obligated to be generous. If you're cheap, you're violating my Torah. If you're good, if you're following my Torah, naturally, you're going to be grateful. If you're not grateful, you're kfuy tova, Hashem hates you. Hashem, the certain people that Hashem hates, one of the people that Hashem hates is ungrateful people. Somebody that does good to you and you return bad, Hashem hates you. And Shlomo Amedach says, there's no way that that person will survive a life without being cursed by Hashem. Because he returned bad for good. Somebody did you a favor, you returned them bad, Hashem has to punish you for it in this world. Why? It's a violation. It's the opposite of Hashem. So, the key is to understand that good is defined by Hashem and you cannot violate the creator of good and his rules and still be deemed good. And that's why to be at peace with yourself is impossible without, being, without your neshama being connected to the source. You see sometimes people, you know, pretend like they're happy. They'll meditate in the middle of the street. They'll uh, do all types of weird things. But if you follow those people closely, you see that they're very bad people. There's one famous story. A woman went to a seminar by Arachim. It's a famous Kiruv organization for the last 30, 40 years named Arachim. And her parents invited her to come to this seminar because she was completely a heretic. And she said, come to the seminar. I'm not coming to the seminar. A bunch of rabbis are going to tell me about uh, their God. I don't want to hear about it. I'm going to India. I'm going to become a, uh, what is it called? A uh, uh, guru. guru. I'm going to become a guru. She goes, okay, listen. Come to the seminar and at least listen. If you come, we'll pay for your ticket to go to become a guru. $1,500. Okay, fine. I'll come to your seminar. How long is the seminar? It's a few hours. Okay. She goes to the seminar. As you would have it, the speaker for that seminar wasn't able to make it. Last minute, something happened. The car broke down. He couldn't make it to the seminar. So the crowd is sitting there, sitting there, sitting there. And they're getting bored. There's now nobody speaking. So they're starting to get up. They're like, oh, no, hold on a second, Robotai. Wait, wait one second. Somebody replacing him is coming soon. But they didn't have anybody. But they, the guy running it saw there's a few religious guys in the front. He says, okay, you, let's go. No, come on, give us you. Little Avrech, 20 years old, says, what's you? I don't know anything. We talk, what's you? He goes, what am I going to teach him? I don't have a I'm not a speaker. I'm came into here. He goes, no, 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 you learn yeshiva? He goes, yeah. No, yada. Teach them whatever you're learning. He's one of them. I, I don't know how to speak. Speak. 500 people. You're going to lose 500 people. It's a sin. Okay, okay, fine, fine. The guy, the kid, me skin, 20 years old, doesn't know what just hit him. He goes on stage. Doesn't know how to speak to people. 
אוקיי, סו, היא נגמרה, מסכת בבא מציע, גמרא, היא סטארט סטיג' דו וואן, וואן איז לרנינג. גמרא בבא מציע, טוקס אבאט השבת אבידה, אם יו פיינד סמתינג דאטס לוסט, יו לוק פור איט טו סי אם דאס איידנטיפיקיישן. יו פיינד א וואלט, אם איט האז איידנטיפיקיישן סימבולס, אן איידי אוף א פרסון או איני סיינס, יו האב טו ריטרן איט טו דה פרסון. היא סטארט טיצ'ינג אם, האו דה טריט סמתינג דאט יו פיינד. Now, between us, who came to the seminar out of those 500 people to learn how to return a lost wallet? Most of those people, they find a wallet, take the money, the wallet goes in the garbage. What are you talking about? So this girl that's supposed to be a guru, she's like, ah, good. This, there's no way this is going to be for me. I'm going to get free money here for nothing. $1,500 I'm getting for just listening to this yot about some, returning some wallet. She sits there for an hour, listens, after a little while, says, okay, I'm finished, I promised you I would come, I came, give me the money for the ticket to India. She goes to India, Miskina. True story. She goes to India, and she finds the guru over there, and she becomes one of the gurus, Talmidim, follows him everywhere he goes. He wakes up, they're next to him. He eats, they're next to him. He's this, they follow him in the street. Wherever he goes, there's an entourage that follow him. And she is on her way to become Guru Guru. She's a cereal box, this thing. Following this guy. She thinks she's happy. She has a weird little hairdo. She doesn't wash her hair. All types of dots and paints on her body. Garbage. But she thinks this is spirituality. This is good. This guru is so special. This guru is such a unique person. They must turn these people into uh, Abu Dazara, these gurus. I know one guy gave all of his money. All of his money to the guru to the point he became almost homeless. Gave his whole family's money, his business, his everything to this guru. Almost my mother became homeless because of the stupidity. Thinking that if he gives, he's going to return. He doesn't realize he's giving to Abu Dazara. He gets punished instead. So anyway, this poor Israeli girl is following this guy that's an idol and an idol worshiper because she thinks it's good and she gives him all of our money and everything. But one day, she's walking behind, uh, as part of the entourage with the guru and she sees that the guru bends down and picks up a wallet that he found in the, on the ground. He opens the wallet takes a bunch of money that's in it, all the money that's in it, and chucks the wallet, throws it over his shoulder. Hey, hold on a second. Mr. Guru, she saw this. Say, whoa, whoa, no, it's a mistake. She picks up the wallet, she goes, hey, uh, your uh, guruness, guru, uh, isn't it uh, not right with the world and with the spirits And with the energy and with the karma and the dharma and the barma and, the, and all the nonsense of the world that you taught us to take something that doesn't belong to you? He goes, no, this is the world giving me what belongs to me. Someone lost it in order for me to take it. Rasha Merusha. On the spot, she realized the whole thing is fake. She realized the whole thing is fake. She left, called her Ima and Abba. Ima, Abba, please send me money. I want to come home. Iman Abba, I haven't heard from her in months, maybe even a few years. <laughs> come home, come home. She comes home. Ima Abba, I want to go to a seminary. I want to go learn Torah. What? What happened to you? They taught you Torah in India? He goes, no, no, I want to learn Torah. Okay, they call the rabbi. Rabbi, uh, please, arrange us something, seminary, something. Get this girl before she changes her mind, goes back to being a guru. After things calm down, she asks her, what happened? She says, tells him what happened with the guru. She goes, okay, fine, you happened with the guru, it's fake, fine, but why do you want to learn Torah? She says, any religion that teaches people even the minute details of how to return something that they found in the middle of the street must be from God. Because that is not human laws. It must be from God. Because humans... Don't return what's lost. Only God does. Must be from God. I want to learn what else God said. So what happened? 
the guy that lost it couldn't get to the lecture. Who made that happen? Hashem made it happen. The guy that gave the lecture didn't know what to say. Who made that happen? Hashem made it happen. Why? Because what he was going to teach them that no one thought was going to be relevant to anything, that's exactly what she needed to hear in order to come back from Avodah Zarah Mamash. That's how much a Kadosh Baruch Hu loves every single Jew. He'll change the whole world, all of nature, flat tires, crashes, depressions, divorces, diseases. Everything looks like it's chaos. It looks like the whole world is collapsing, but in reality, it's all Hashem maneuvering and manipulating the world in order to return His children back home. All of it is to return His children back home. And the smart ones come back home. The fools continue making excuses. Next. Every creature, human, not human, is a... Uh, is, uh, I wouldn't say child of God, but is a creature, a creature of, God. of God. Yeah. Okay. So, um, regarding Jewish or not Jewish, there still is is still a heaven for both. God. Still, still a heaven for both, or you have to be Jewish to be uh, a good person, or you have to follow Torah to be a good person, you have to follow or, Torah or, or to can be you be a goy and still be a good person? 100%. Or yes, there is Torah, the same Torah. Is for Jews and non-Jews. The only difference between the two is Jews are obligated to follow 613 laws of the Torah and seven laws of the rabbis. Total 620 laws, which in reality, maybe 10% of them are actually something that each person can do in their life. Because we don't have a Bet HaMikdash, we're not all Kohanim, we're not all women, we're not all men. So, Jews have the higher obligation of mitzvot. Non-Jews have the seven Noahide laws. And all of the ethical laws. So Noahide laws are like such as don't murder, don't worship idols, build yourself a government, don't eat an animal while it's still alive, and so on. Plus all of the ethical laws. Like for example, uh, you know, your parents, you have to honor them. Even though it's not one of the seven laws of Noah, you still have to do it because it's an ethical law. And so on and so forth. So the same Torah teaches Jews and non-Jews the rules. If a non-Jew follows his, the rules that apply to him or her as a non-Jew, they have a share in heaven. They have a share in Olam Abba. They are considered not only good, but they're also considered chasdei umot olam, the righteous among the world. They have a special treatment in heaven. If a Jew follows the rules, follows the Torah, he's not only called someone that's righteous, but he, he's a tzaddik. He, she's a tzaddikah. She goes to heaven. Opposite, they don't follow Jew or non Jew, they're considered Reshaim, they get punished. There's reward and there's punished for both. Now, but what about animals? If you notice, on the uh, fourth day, there's a lot of today, there is a, a lot of uh, liberals that push the issue of being uh, vegetarian because uh, it's not nice to kill animals. They don't want to eat hamburgers because they don't want to kill the cow because the cow is nice cow. She didn't do anything bad to you. They don't want to kill the bird. They don't want to kill the chicken because the chicken has a right to live. The stupidity of people always amazes me. If it was a stock, the price would be infinity. Continue going higher. Now, the reality is that animals were created for the sake of serving men. And one of the proofs that we have in the Torah is that uh, right here, in, uh, actually in the um, Sefer Bereshit. I'll show you in a second where's the Pasuk. So when it says that the uh, Hashem created the animals, the Ofot, the, uh, the, the, the birds, the uh, cattle, uh, and the Dagim, and the, uh, the fish, if you take the first letter of each one of those uh, of each one of those words, the afot, the behemoth, and the dagim, it spells the word evid, meaning these animals are here to serve you, serve men. So the point of animals is to be used by mankind in order to serve Hashem. So the animals, you can eat them if they're kosher, not eat them if they're not kosher. Not eating 
a non-kosher animal is also serving Hashem. If you see shrimp that looks delicious to you, even though it's a cockroach of the sea, but for some reason it looks delicious to you, not eating it is also a mitzvah. You're not sinning. If you see, if you're, if you're not sinning, it's a big thing. If it, a, uh, you see that there's pepperoni pizza and you're starving, and you know that as a Jew, you're not allowed to eat pepperoni pizza. Milk and meat. You don't eat it. It's a mitzvah. So, point being is that it's not just about eating. It's also about not eating. It's not just about doing mitzvot. It's also about not sinning. So, the animals have a purpose in the world as far as they're used. They're used for clothing. They're used for uh, work. They're used to eat. They're used for different purposes. People that are liberal and uh, say that you're not allowed to kill animals are simply violating the Torah by pretending to be more merciful than God. Because God said, slaughter the animal and eat it. Use it for work. You're saying, no, no, don't kill the animal. So you're, you're trying to, because don't kill it because it's not nice. You're, it's not merciful. But God said, kill it. You're saying, don't kill it. God said, kill it in a merciful way. You're saying, don't kill it. So what are you trying to say? You're trying to say that you have more mercy than God. What does that mean? You're a heretic. You think that you have more mercy than God. Because God said, kill it and eat it and use it in a kosher way. You're saying, don't kill it. That means that you're a heretic because you think you have more mercy than God. So, all of these people that call themselves religious, but at the same time say that they're vegetarian because, not because they don't like the taste, but rather because they don't think it's right to kill animals, they're 100% kufrin. If you don't like the taste of meat or chicken or whatever it is, that's your problem. Even though the Gemara says that in order to be really happy, you have to have meat and wine, that's a different story. You don't like the taste? Fine. You don't like the taste. But if you're not eating animals that are kosher because you think it's mean, you have a serious problem with Hashem. So, all of these different things, I mean, as far as the mitzvot, we have it for the Jews, for the non-Jews. A non-Jew's obligation is to serve Hashem by following the mitzvot, but also by helping Jews become religious and closer to Hashem. And also non-Jews become religious and closer to Hashem. And leave, abandon all of the false teachings of Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, and all of the other false uh, places. A Jew's obligation is to serve Hashem and also help Jews become religious as well as help non-Jews. See the truth. Be a light to the nations. If you see a non-Jew that's interested in serving Hashem in a... uh, uh, in doing the right thing, but he doesn't know what to do. Point him in the right direction. You're allowed to share all of our lectures with non-Jews. Most of our lectures are general ne- lectures that apply to everyone. Baruch Hashem, we have many, many students and supporters that are non-Jewish. And many of them are righteous non-Jews. They're going to stay non-Jews. And some of them convert to Judaism. Some of them convert. We help them convert. Some of them don't convert. They can't for whatever reason or another, either marriage or lifestyle, whatever it is, but they're still righteous. So, there's nothing wrong with being a righteous Gentile. Alvai. Sometimes, you you know, it's, I think to myself, Alvai that Hashem would uh, judge the wicked Jews as uh, righteous Gentiles, but unfortunately it's not going to work. A righteous Gentile is in much better shape than a wicked Jew could ever be. So, that's why I say that anyone that converts for the wrong reason is the stupidest person alive. Because you could have, you could have actually easily been a righteous Gentile and got to Allah Abba. Now you're a wicked Jew. Now you get to gain home instead. For what? To impress some people? To have a chuppah, feed a bunch of strangers? People spend so much money on these weddings to feed a bunch of strangers and show off how much money they have, but don't even have money to, to buy a house. One person told me, listen, my wife spent all the money, we can't buy a house. I said, what would she spend it on? He said, she bought a $60,000 bag. I said, excuse me? A bag, what, for uh, to put an a- airplane in it? He goes, no, no, a handbag. I said, for $60,000? He said, yeah. I said, are you a millionaire? He goes, no, that was our life savings. I said, you're still married? He goes, yeah, what could I do? Throw her in the streets. A woman like this, Rashaid. She took the family's savings and spent it on the handbag? 
Bemet, there's people like this exist. Why? She wants to show off to her friends that she has this bag for sixty thousand dollars. They don't have a house. They're living on rent. But she has a sixty thousand dollar bag. That's how sick people are. People are sick. Why? Because she thought that if she buys this bag, it's gonna make her happy. While making everybody else miserable. Any more questions or we finish it tonight? Yeah, Chabot. Uh, the commandment to observe, to keep, to, to honor Shab uh, Shabbat, and also uh, all these holidays, is it even possible for for some, like a, uh, a vegan to to be Jewish? Is it possible for somebody vegan to vegan, be Jewish? Vegan, yes. Meaning if he wants to convert? Or was, yes, let's say if someone wants to or convert, or if he's already Jewish, uh, if he's already say. Jewish and he doesn't eat meat, it's a, uh, he's, uh, because he doesn't like it, not because he, uh, feels bad for cows and chickens, uh, then, uh, it's not necessarily going to be e as easy for him to, uh, get to the ultimate level of happiness and joy and sanctifying, uh, the Shabbat, but he can still do a lot of other things right, and it's fine. It's not, it doesn't make him a kofel if he doesn't like to eat meat. Uh, for example, I don't drink uh, liquor. Uh, you know, so once in a while I'll have a little bit of wine for Kiddush, but it's really suffering for me. I don't like it. Something happened to my body over the years that uh, I can't tolerate alcohol at all. It tastes disgusting to me, and it bothers me a lot. It bothers my stomach and so on. So even on Purim, even on Purim, I'll drink as little as possible just to fulfill some mill obligation. Sometimes not even that. I'll eat, you know, I'll have grape juice because it bothers me. So that doesn't make me a kofel. It just, this hurts me. So you're not supposed to hurt yourself. If the meat hurts you, it's not a mitzvah to eat it. No one says you should hurt yourself by eating meat or hurt yourself by eating chicken or drinking wine. But if you're not doing it, not because it doesn't hurt you, but simply, uh, you know, you can't afford it. That also is not a problem. It's also not a problem. But if you're not doing it, you like it, it's good, but uh, you are uh, feel bad for cows. You're still a Jew, but uh, you have a problem. You have a problem with your understanding of uh, who is the one that really makes the rules. Because you're, in essence, if you dig deep down into your belief system, you'll realize that it's a little bit of kfira by saying that you feel bad for the cow. And Hashem doesn't. It's, there's something wrong with you. Hashem said it's a mitzvah to slaughter the cow this exact way. And if you slaughter it that exact way, that cow has fulfilled its role in the world. You're thinking that you're helping the cow by not killing it. What you're not realizing is there's a very good chance that Rizal says some people, they, re they make sins and they have to come back to this world. Sometimes they come back as people to get another chance because in the last previous carnation, they cheated on their wife. So they have to come back and be a good husband in this year. In the last carnation, they stole money. So they have to come back to this world and give back the money. They, uh, in the last time, they did something. They lied. They have to come back and do tshuva. But sometimes they did a certain sin. They have to come back as an animal. They have to come back as an animal. Why? To feel certain pain of an animal. You're thinking that you're helping this animal by not slaughtering it. But in reality, there's a neshama in there that the only way it's going to get to heaven is if you slaughter it in a kosher way. So in reality, that neshama is cursing you out because you idiot. I need to go to heaven. I don't want to be a cow. Because of you, I can't, be, I can't go to heaven. I'm suffering now. So people think that they're smarter than God. And that's the problem. You're never allowed to be overly merciful. And that was one of the mistakes that Shaul HaMelech made. Shaul HaMelech made a mistake when he did not kill all of the cattle of uh, of the uh, of Agag, the uh, the Amalek king, because he figured, why should I destroy all of these cattle? Let me bring them as korbanot, as sacrifices to Hashem. Why just destroy them and waste all this money? What he didn't know is that Hashem said, kill everything, including the cattle. Why? Because the Am Amalekites had witchcraft, and what kind of witchcraft did they have? The ones that survived were able to turn themselves into cattle. 
if he would have killed the cattle, he would have killed all of Amalek. We wouldn't have suffered the Erev Rav till this day. Because he didn't kill them, all of them survived. Thought, thought he was being uh, righteous. He made a mistake. Never allowed to be overly righteous. Hashem said something, there's a reason for it. Same thing with uh, this uh, Shloch HaKen. There's a mitzvah, a special mitzvah, that if you get to do it once in your life, you're very lucky. A bird, you see a bird's nest and there's eggs. And the bird is on the eggs and you shoo the bird. And you take the eggs. To a, your rational common sense, it sounds very vicious. You're taking the, uh, ch- the, the, the bird's babies. It's mitzvah from the Torah, it's going to give you long life. Why? We don't know. We don't know why. Hashem said so. Because Hashem said so. That's the mitzvah. There's no explanation for From, it. Mr. You, you just take it and something, you, you raise it, it yeah, and you something, it and then you, and you put you, it back. You return it. You return it. But the, the point is you take it and you shoo the mother bird away. After, yeah. But the uh, point is, is that you shoo the mother bird away. Most likely the mother bird's not going to come and those eggs are going to die. Sometimes the certain birds, you touch their eggs, they don't come back. They feel like you violated their, uh, their uh, kids and they don't come back. Point is, in essence, in, in so many words, you're killing the birds. Let's say, you're killing the birds. Mitzvah. Why? Hashem said so. To show us what? It doesn't matter if it makes sense to you. It makes sense to God, that's all that matters. God said to do it, that's all that matters. And the Gemara says, anyone that tries to soften it and say, oh, it's just to teach you mercy because now you're going to feel bad for the bird, we quiet him, say, shut up, don't make excuses. That's not the reason. It's not to teach you mercy. What's the reason? God said so. That's the reason. Yeah, but it's mean. Okay, you mean you're going to go up and deal with Hashem, explain to Hashem why you think he's mean. He's going to show you a nice explanation, one-on-one, about all your, your comments about him. That's really the reason of all of the mitzvot. And that's what converts and balet shuva and from from birth and all people in the world need to understand. The only thing you need to understand is that God said so. That's it. God said keep the Ten Commandments, you keep the Ten Commandments. Whether you agree with it or not is irrelevant. I'm going to teach you something and then we're going to finish for the night. This week's parasha is the last parasha in the Torah. Vezot Abracha. Vezot Abracha means, and uh, this is the blessing, the blessing of Moshe Rabbeinu. It says, Vezot Abracha Asher, Berach Moshe Isha Elohim, et Bnei Yisrael Ifnei Moto. And this is the blessing that Moshe, the man of God, bestowed among the people, the children of Israel, before his death. So the Or Chaim HaKadosh says, why is Moshe Rabbeinu, out of all the descriptions, out of all of the forefathers that we have, is the only one that's called Isha Elohim, the man of God. I mean, that's something, that's, that's the unbelievable description. Not only that, and there's no one that's ever going to be like Moshe Rabbeinu. Not only that, the only one that ever spoke to Hashem face to face. Not only that, Torah Moshe, the Torah is named after Moshe Rabbeinu. I mean, the, the stuff that Moshe, the, the names that Hashem describes Moshe, what did he merit all this for? I mean, Avram Avinu didn't merit this. Yitzhak Avinu didn't merit this. Yaakov Avinu didn't merit this. Adam Arishon didn't merit this. Moshe Rabbeinu, Isha Elohim. Who said it? God. God calls him, he's the man of God. Or Chaim says, what's the reason? The reason is, Rabotai, is truthfully, Or Chaim writes it and many of the poskim agree with it. There's only a few that disagree. But, say, truthfully, Moshe Rabbeinu, our dear Moshe Rabbeinu, our Isha Elohim, our Navi, our everything, the prophet of all prophets, was born with a special holy Neshama that brought light to the world, but with all of the worst midot that exist in the world. Murderer, rapist, adulterer, thief, liar, everything. All of the worst character traits he had. Meaning, in essence, 
he had the ability to be the worst person alive make Hitler look like a baby make Paro look like a little infant nothing that's actually what Moshe Rabbeinu was born with that's what Moshe Rabbeinu had his whole life he had these midot so how could this person that has all these horrible qualities be called Isha Elohim man of God you have all these horrible midot because Moshe Rabbeinu used the Torah to overcome all of the natural horrible midot that he had all of the horrible character traits that he had the fact that he wanted to murder people overcame it the fact that he wanted to steal overcame it the fact that he wanted to be angry overcame it the fact that he wanted to steal overcame it all of the horrible things we struggle with individually you have one you have one I have 17 you have three you have every has a few he had all of them you think you have difficulty he has a million times more difficulty than all of us put together what made him the man of God by using the Torah to overcome all of them how did he do it he says God said so that's enough Yirat Shamayim. Oh, Chaim HaKadosh says the only reason he was able to become Isha Elohim and overcome all of the obstacles is because his fear of Hashem. That's it. Not love, not the fear of Hashem. He was afraid of Hashem. That's it. That's how he overcame all of the horrible qualities. To such an extent, the Midrash says there was a king that heard about Moshe Rabbeinu that took Am Yisrael out of Egypt, took him from slaves to be the masters, split the ocean, spoke to God, Mount Sinai, says, I need a painting of this guy. He sent people, sent painters to come to Moshe Rabbeinu and draw him. Brought him back and he saw this evil looking person. He says, this is not Moshe, Moshe is Sadiq. Why did you draw me here? He goes, no, no, this is Moshe. He goes, no way. He had people that worked for him that were able to read faces. He says, what do you see here? He says, we see a person that's a murderer. We see a rapist. We see a thief. We see an uh, adulterer. We see this guy is a horrible person. Who's this murderer? Uh, Your Highness. He goes, yeah, this is Moshe. They said, no, no way. Moshe Rabbeinu is a tzaddik of the Jews. No way. He wanted to kill the, the, the painters. He goes, listen, Your Highness, please give us a chance. Go see it yourself. He went to go, he went and found Moshe Rabbeinu and all of Am Yisrael in the middle of the desert. And he sees Moshe Rabbeinu is identical to the paintings. It's not, he says, uh, uh, my, uh, Moshe, uh, uh, I'm sorry, but how come you look like this? You look evil. You look this. You look that. He says, you foolish man, you're looking at the physicality. You're thinking that the physical is the spiritual. I was born exactly with everything that you describe. All of the horrible character traits, that's how I look. And they affected my image. Physical. But I perfected my neshama and overcame all of those obstacles. That's the reason why Kadosh Baruch Hu gave me the, the, the role of freeing Am Yisrael, splitting the ocean, speaking to him, being Moshe Rabbeinu, by overcoming all of our obstacles. Every one of us is born with a few bad midot. Moshe was born with everything, everything bad. But that shows us the power of Torah. And that's why Moshe Rabbeinu was called Isha Elohim. Why? This Ish, this person, all he cared for was the Kadosh Baruch Hu. He feared Hashem and that was enough to fulfill all of the mitzvot. He didn't need to understand it. He didn't ask any questions. All he knew, Hashem said so, that's it. That's Alvai, all of us do the same thing. Hashem said so, that's it. I don't need any other reasons. You can find certain reasons of why there are certain things that we do but in reality even if you don't find the reason or you don't understand the reason or you don't even agree with the reason it doesn't matter you still have to do it because Hashem said so may this year be the year that each and every one of us and all of Klal Yisrael and all of the righteous Gentiles do what Hashem said as he said it regardless of whether they understand or even agree with what he said, but simply do it because he said it. 
ברוך אדוני לעולם, אמן ואמן.